This episode is supported by Battlefilm.com. Hi, Octane Anime Action is the name of the game in Relic Knights. Mount up in your mecha and battle for glory at our Relic Knights hub on BeastsOfWar.com. It's time for 28mm World War II action. Will you recreate history or reshape it your way? On the Bolt Action Hub at BeastsOfWar.com. Good morning, it's the weekender time. We have a doozy of a competition for you today. If you want to win a box, uh, the starter core box of Star Wars Legions. Oh, that's a good one. And we're also giving away the battle foam uh, trays to, to, to put it all in when you're Ooh, finished. That's nice. Um, stay tuned to the end of the show. In this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the Star Wars Legions. Um, we're also going to be to looking at some of the malign portent stuff from uh, Games Workshop. And we have uh, other interesting news. And for you historical uh, guys, we have a super um, interview with uh, a historical editor, Oriskany, from the mm. site, where we're going to be talking about Vietnam warfare mm -hmm. and the Tet Offensive. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really interesting, but that's at the end of the show. Right, um, uh, to kick us off, Star Wars Legion. Mm -hmm. We've had content all of this week. Yeah. So we've had Let's Plays, unboxings, we've had a painting vlog, which is freely available for you guys to look at. It gives you an idea of the kind of the behind the scenes content that we have for our backstage, yep, yep. uh, where John was given three days. Yeah. He turned around really well. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. Also, in tandem with that, we have John uh, working away on an at at. So, if you remember whenever we did Hoth, he's back at another at at, but now he's doing it differently so you may want to go check that out on backstage yeah yeah so there's a load of star wars legion stuff has taken place over on beastofwar.com this week so if you're interested head across to the site and check it out mm -hmm. this morning i'm joined by ben in the chair in the new chair, <laughs> new chair. Do, do you want to give us a little bit of a little glimpse there of the chair? There it there is, the new chair. <laughs> Thanks to our backstagers, we were able to afford a new chair for Ben as well. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. I'm joined by Justin in that chair Morning. and Az in that chair. And it breaks my heart to say it, but this is Az's final episode with us as, as Beasts of War, Az. Mm. <laughs> you okay? Is he alright? No, I, I don't know. Is he alright? Is he alright? I don't know, what the hell? Do you know CPR? No. I do. I've been watching Logan Paul. <laughs> some really cool things coming out from the show only for you to go check out uh, there's some really cool stuff coming out for Age of Sigma that we're going to be diving into and then we've got some really cool stuff uh, happening with wise <laughs> with him and things going forward and of course we've got this Star Wars Legion stuff that came out during the week too I can hear Doctor Who.
tiny red knob sticking out of his pants. Go get it. I can't believe our content manager's dead. What are we gonna do? It's a screwdriver. That's not just any screwdriver, Justin. That is a sonic screwdriver. So what you do? We can fix him. What? We can fix him with this. Serious? Yes. If we point the red knob at his face and then shake it vigorously. Uh, there. Okay. I don't know what horn dreams are. Files particularly in the lovely kind of Ginger, is that a new accent? What? That's not a content manager. That's just another song. Oh, come on, let's go. Come on, you. Oh, the show must go on, boys. Saturdays. Yes, uh, as has departed <laughs> <laughs> in spectacular fashion. So Elvis has left the building. I think he took a little red knob with him as well, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, he, uh, best of luck with it. We'd just like to say a massive thank you to us. He's been a great, uh, great team member. We're expecting to have him back. We, we had a vlog um, a little bit earlier in the week where we were chatting about where Az is off to. So um, if you want to get caught up on that, come across. But yeah, a mm. massive thank you to Az. We will miss you until until we get you back in the studio very soon. Yeah. Um. Of course, Sam has now filled the gaping as hole that was <laughs> that, that, that has emerged as a result. I will, of that. I will do my best. <laughs> See, I, 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 don't, I don't know. It's, it's a little small, so things might rattle around a bit loosely for the first while. Yes, but but he, but he will grow to fill it. He, he will what did I sign myself up for? Um, but the, the key oh, thing is, um, in the order of blame, you don't blame me for anything anymore. I just, I just sit here and talk shit about gaming. <laughs> uh, he is now the new content manager on Beast of War. Um, he has been in training for some time now. So any any issues you have with the content and stuff like that, there you blame him. And I will blame <laughs> Justin. <laughs> I, I guess uh, the old saying. <laughs> Rolls downhill. Here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it totally does. It totally does. Right. Um, uh, before we get on, uh, get on with the show entirely. It's it's worth mentioning. Next weekend we have um, a beta weekend. This is something slightly different. So um, it's a little bit like a boot camp, but it's actually a beta weekend where we're going to be beta testing. Um, Legends of the Fabled Realms, a yes. new game from mm -hmm. Foreground. It, it, it kickstarted successfully. A few months ago, um, we have people coming in from all over the world, coming in as, from as far as the United States yep. uh, to join us on this. And uh, we're going to be stress testing the legacy system mm -hmm. um, of, of the game where your uh, characters and your war bands develop um, over time. Yep. And the guys are bringing enough so that everybody's war band can actually expand through the weekend oh, and run for, the whole legacy great. system. For yeah. the participants, um, oh, yeah. you're going to get some amazing stuff. You you will not be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And the more you play, the more you get. It's just going to be goodies after goodies after goodies. Um, however, for you guys at home, um, uh, we are going to get you to participate with us as well. Firstly, the rules are completely free to download at the moment if you want to go and download them yep. and have a look through the game. But we're also having a kit bashing uh, competition yes. yep so we're in one we're going to have an active forum post during the course of the weekend where you'll be able to go in and uh, use any miniatures you want because one of the big things about legends of the fabled Realms <coughs> is the guys at foreground actively encourage you to pull miniatures and components in from all sorts of fantasy and historical games into their world. Yep, they have two digital factions which actually allow you to actually point and start up your stuff as you bring it in so you can actually start building and really tweaking and tuning your warband from the very get-go how you want to play it. Yeah, I think we're going to see some really interesting designs when the community gets hold of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we had a blast just kit bashing a few oh, yeah, people, yeah. People, yeah. things together. I built a full war goblin warband. Yeah, so you guys will be able to kit bash up miniatures, and one of you that gets involved in that post is then going to win a prize where you're going to get to work with the guys at Foreground. Yep. 
on a new character or yes and that prize is up for grabs twice so once for everybody online mm-hmm. who posts in the forum topic and once for everybody who's turning up to the event yeah so there are going to be two new community created characters going into the field realms which i think is such a cool prize and then as well as that we are giving away thousands of pounds mm. of terrain um, yeah. i mean we have four huge terrain prizes um, uh, that you'll be able to to get involved in it, it is this is probably the biggest weekend we have ever done it, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's going to be insane yeah all next week we're going to be vlogging about the build of all of the scenery and the terrain and stuff and the run-up to it mm-hmm. we have a small amazonian forest worth of trees uh, to put together we so do. we do it's going to be immense so um uh, join us all next week so if you thought star wars week was cool yeah it was cool oh very um yeah. next week is going to be equally cool in a, in a fantastical fantasy um, awesome kind of way i i do have a little note for future star wars content i am mm-hmm. currently talking to jerry to get him back into the studio to do more games uh, I would like to apologize for the rules and mistakes we have made, but we are learning the game. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, hopefully you're enjoying the content and you enjoy the future content of it. Oh, the game! The game just the game is fantastic, and the incredible. the battle kiwi terrain I just love. Yeah, it was oh, fantastic that, yeah. to build. They were great uh, sending all that over to yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Okay, right. Um, I want to take a quick uh, swish to tell you about some hubs. When we come back, we're going to have a look at uh, some Age of Sigmar. The malign portents. We'll be right back after this. Twisted aliens and demented cultists battle across the devastating science fiction world of Dark Age. Muster your forces and learn to survive at beastsofwar.com. Fight for the Iron Kingdoms as a warcaster. Take control of the mighty jacks, arcane devices, and dark sorceries to bring the fight to the War Machine Hub on beastsofwar.com. So in the studio this week, we received the malign portent stuff. Yes. So um, let me quickly uh, show you through the, the models, because then I want to get into the book and uh, get Ben to tell us a bit about that. So uh, kicking off, I have um, uh, Lord Ord- Ordinator Voris Starstrike. So um, Ben, what do we know about him? Uh, so this guy um, works for Order, and he's one of the Stormcast Eternals. And the Lord Ordinators are a little bit sort of like the scryers and the oracles of the Stormcast Eternals. Yeah. And this guy has seen what is coming on the horizon, and so he's left his library in his tower, and he's uh, heading out onto the battlefield in order to, to sort of galvanize the forces of Sigmar against uh, what's happening in the realms of death at the moment. Yeah. So he's a little bit of a seer, a little bit of a learned man, but he's also, as you might imagine, for a Stormcast Eternal, quite the warrior as well on the tabletop. Because uh, one of the interesting things about him is obviously he's a named character but maybe we're going to see further down the line more of this sort of lord or ordinator side of things going on so looking a little bit more into the the sort of the learning and the sort of the background and the mythological and the arcane side of the the stormcast eternals would be pretty cool yeah, so, yeah. okay the next up next crisp. up we have the slaves to darkness the 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 miniatures are oh, uh, are sort of stunning yeah to coin a phrase um we have slaves to uh, darkoth war Qu- war queen Marakar yes. Blood Sky. So let me let me just zoom into there. There we go. Um, yeah. Uh, so so she's um, one of the characters that's not necessarily your typical Chaos Warrior. Uh, she's not going to be one of the ones clad in like the mighty Chaos armor that we used to see in the old world and stuff. But she's one of the the War Queens who have uh, sort of brought together. Uh, a whole bunch of different tribes that you would normally have known as the Marauders of Chaos and stuff back in the old world. And she's sort of uh, bringing them to the to, to battle against what's happening in the realms of death. Because uh, obviously the Chaos Gods are a little bit worried about what uh, Nagash is doing over there. And so they've summoned all these uh, War Queens together. And this is the lead one who's taking uh, them off on a little bit of a crusade into the realm of death to fight back uh, the undead legions and stuff. And sort of cement the claim of uh, the Chaos Gods over the, the mortal realms and stuff. Mm. Now... When it comes to Age of Sigma, I've heard a lot of people describe it as having that kind of hair metal feel to it. Yes. And with yeah. this model, I especially see that. She looks like she belongs <laughs> on a heavy metal album cover. Yeah, yeah I you, agree. you could swap the weapon for a guitar or something, and I think it would work quite well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, brilliant. next up we have Keldrek, Knight of the Shrouds. This is an incredible miniature. Yeah, uh, so this guy is a, uh, he was a cursed knight uh, who sort of gave his soul over to Nagash in uh, um, in exchange for great power. 
But this also sort of came at a price as well, and the Gash made him one of his lieutenants, and now he's the one who will lead the forces of Gash out of the realm of death, conquering all of the lands around it, and sort of going through the realm gates to try and spread um, the sort of darkness beyond that as well. So he's a very interesting character, a little bit of a cursed fellow as well. So it's really interesting seeing how his narrative is going to mix into what happens with the Lime Portents as well. The the miniatures look absolutely fabulous. You know, they look like they'll go together really, really easily as well. There doesn't there's not there's not much in the way of complexity yeah. to them. There's a hell of a lot of packaging. To <laughs> yeah, them. there is. I, I've been I've been quite surprised by the sheer volume of yeah. packaging. Look at the boxes piling up over here. Okay, now to my personal favorite, and this is Fungoid Cave Shaman Snazgar. Stink mullet. Yeah. I, <laughs> stink I, mullet? I, yeah, stink, stink mullet. mullet. I love this guy um, with all his mushroomy goodness. Um, uh, go and check out a previous Weekender where I give the entire world an education on mushrooms. Um, oh, yeah. So <laughs> let me just look. Oh, it just looks so lovely. Ben, tell me about him. Yeah, so uh, this guy is, um, again, Games Workshop looking at a sort of different side uh, to one of the factions. Obviously, Destruction has had a lot of Uruks in the past. You've seen the big burly guys in their mighty armor. This guy is looking at what happens with the goblins in the world of the mortal realms. And um, as you might imagine, as we, as we look at the model, it's got some crazy stuff going on with mushrooms. He snorts a lot of it, hence the sort of metal nose that he's got going on as well, mm -hmm. as you might imagine. Uh, but yes, he's seen all sorts of different sort of visions and things from Gork and Mork. And uh, he is uh, going to be sort of um, galvanizing the forces of destruction to sort of go on their own little crusade into the realm of uh, death and sort of maybe um, take advantage of all the, the carnage that is going on and maybe, you know, put a little bit of a foothold out there for their forces as well. So it's going to be very interesting seeing how all of these different forces, they're all known as harbingers, by the way, these guys. So they're all, they're all sort of main characters within this uh, evolving story in the world of Malign Portents. And sort of it's going to be very interesting seeing how they all work together and how their narratives clash and stuff in the, the stories to come for this. So. Okay. And finally, we have the Malign Portents book itself. Um, ben, it is beautiful. Yeah, it, it does look very nice. Um, I've seen a lot of people uh, talking about this already, saying it's very very well presented. And as you might imagine with Games Workshop, they do a really good job on all the artwork and stuff. And this is one of those things that's going to be fascinating for people that want to learn a little bit more about the lore and the background of Age of Sigmar. Because one of the big things they've said they've been doing with Malign Portents is looking at exploring the realms in more detail. Obviously, of course, the realm of death, looking at maps and all sorts of different charts, as well as the artwork for the different races and factions that have been brought in under the Harbingers and stuff as well. Um, this uh, this book um, puts forth a lot of stuff uh, for you to use in terms of uh, gameplay, as well as the, uh, the lore. And they're obviously going to be uh, running their global campaign as well for Malign Portents, which means that everything you do will sort of feed into the, the ongoing project that is Age of Sigmar in the future with Games Workshop. And this book sort of offers up a whole bunch of new uh, sort of options for you to do that as well. So you've got new uh, scenarios, new rules and stuff like that thrown into the mix. And it's going to be very interesting how it all comes together. So Yeah, yeah it's um, we're just looking through it and it's it, it's an incredible book. It, it, it has so much stuff in it, Ben. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to getting a sit down with you and uh, getting getting my teeth into this and learning uh, learning a bit more about it. Yeah. So, um, Malign Portents, it's out at the moment, so uh, mm -hmm. if you're interested in checking it out, and as Ben says, there's campaigns and things like that that are, that yep. are connected yep. to this, yep. so yep. yeah, definitely well worth checking out. In other Warhammer news, uh, for mm -hmm. those that care about it, uh, Total War Warhammer 2 have now released the Tomb Kings to actually be able to be a playable faction on the PC version, so yeah, they... PC game is your thing. It's there for you now. Yeah, and in other Warhammer 40k news, um, Beast of War is likely to be sending R2 to the European yeah. uh, Championships, take the Prague, what is it, the Prague? Prague Open. The Prague Open. Um, so we're, we're looking at the possibility of sending these two guys to the Prague Open to give us um, some coverage from, I think it's the largest, one of the largest independent European like that. Yeah, I think tournaments. it's one of so. four GTs in Europe, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. So it, it should be a huge event. And yeah. Prague... Beautiful city. I can't wait to get a look at. And the, I yeah. believe that there's the, still there's still, they're still uh, tickets and spaces available if you fancy entering that. Yep. Um, so we'll uh, have sold them all in now. Yeah, they'll well, be coming just for us. No, um, no. no. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> you would have come to see me next year. If you fancy me, um, they want to find out what state your beard is in at any given point. I, I, I will say <laughs> it is getting to that annoying stage where it may come off again soon. If they're ready, yeah. if they're ready, you should take our Prosonians with you. Yes. Uh, maybe. 
So we'll, what, we'll, what we'll try to do is we'll try to get, because we're building the Personians. If you haven't checked these out, we'll get some photographs up. So uh, in Backstage, we've been building our own custom um, custom in, uh, Astra Militarum yes. uh, force. And um, it was, it, it was, it's been a real uh, project of love for ourselves because it gave us the opportunity with, of, to do something that we've long wanted to do. And that was to take a, take a historical range mm. and then sci-fi it up. I happen to love Napoleonics and stuff like that yep. there. I, I think I think the Napoleonic era is just it's just so something so cool about it. And I I've always loved things like the Vostroyans and, yes. and stuff like this in 40k. So I've long wanted to know about an Astra Militarum um homeworld mm. um, uh, where they have they are still in that kind of they, they yeah. still adhere to a lot of the Napoleonic so where kind of dress yeah. and stuff. Where their culture isn't that of the rest of the grim dark. Yes. It, it still has that very well, yeah. I, militant I, mindset. Of I Napoleonic. have been talking to John, and the backstory is actually beginning to bubble in the back of his mind. Mm -hmm. So these are, they were a Napoleonic society, tech society. The Imperium has came back to them, and the tech is yeah. just starting to feed into their, their normal everyday life. The uniforms and stuff haven't caught up, things like that. They haven't yeah. been set much armor, which is why you have one big massive tank that they revere above all else. Yeah. And it says their mindset will be very much like the Death Corps of Krieg. Yeah. Because they seem to be cut off from the Imperium at the moment. Not only uh, that, but this particular guard force that we've created are still very heavily focused on mounted cavalry. Uh, so, lots of rough riders. So we have loads of, of, of mounted horse cavalry. Mm. And it, it is it's still in it's still a work in progress, but we have we we have twenty parts in the series so far where you yep. can see choosing the models. All of the every model has a conversion of some sort on it, yep. and it's that it's bringing that historical range and the grim dark together. Yes. And they have a Macarius, um, I think it's a Macarius executioner possibly, yeah. um, as a, as this kind of tank that they absolutely revere. We have all the mounted cavalry. They have all these pennants and flags and things. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be moving into bringing that back onto the vlogs where it'll be finished up. But what I'm thinking we should do, mm -hmm. no normal army case, no normal no. army transport no. is going to carry that. No, no definitely So not. we should um, have a look at uh, actually seeing if we can get custom a custom foam um, stuff from Battlefoam and see if yeah. the guys at Battlefoam can work out some kind of custom way. Well, I think they they, they still do their their custom loadouts where you can actually oh, yeah. trace the shape of your yeah. miniature and uh -huh. then send that through to get put into trace. If anyone can do it, Battlefoam oh, yeah. can. And I've of, I've always thought about challenging them with this. Mm. Um, uh, so if it, we're going to have a crack at that, I think where we'll see if we can get the army and challenge Battlefoam because some of those guys are carrying lances and the lances are pointing straight up. Others have lances pointed out. Yeah. They all and have the these pennants, pennants and flags oh, yeah, yeah, behind them. them. So we'll, we'll do that. And if we get it ready in time, mm -hmm. um, I think you, you, know, you guys should maybe take it to the Prague Open and see if we can get somebody to play it. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> so we get an experienced player to play, not one of us. Not one of us, oh. no. We <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Harlequin player. I just I'd be wondering why can I not get the turn one charge? Yeah, right. We'll see if we can get an army list, right? Oh, okay, and uh, we'll see if we can get an experienced player um, to actually play the army. Okay, and we'll we'll just film it as a wee battle report or something. If there's if there's time, okay, to show the Personians in action. Okay, in that case, seeing as it's the inaugural trip between myself and Sam, Sam, you're carrying the army. It's your responsibility. If it gets broke, you're the one that's in the crap. But those battle phone cases are bigger than me. Yeah, it will put you in it as well. <laughs> okay, do you know what? I'm getting restless. Oh, I think oh. I think it's time to take it to take a little walk. Okay, because I think it's time for Warren to meet Matt. This week, I'm taking you to the sexy chem zone. Yeah. So this is the chem zone, Matt. Yes. From Game Mat EU. And the terrain is the industrial ward from uh, Foreground. Yeah, Jezerai Industrial Ward. Jezerai Industrial, industrial Ward. Yeah, so this is the, the set they did as a huge mega bundle a good while ago. Uh, yeah. Beautiful stuff. 
Now, we've given some of this away as a prize. We have. And we've I, given away three of these mats as a prize. We yeah. have. You need to continue watching Beast of War because we like to give away prizes. Right, so the Chemzone mat. I want to look at the mat first and then we can look at a, a bit of the terrain. So sure. this is kind of... Um, Right, let's start throwing around ideas. First thing that comes to mind for me is this is the floor of a manufactory. Yeah. Yep. Uh, for me, this is an abandoned sector in a, a hive world. Yeah. So a, an abandoned level. Oh, God, yes. Or the inside of a Necron monolith. Uh, Can you imagine the Necrons? Well, the only thing that would make it a bit non-Necrony. Perhaps, perhaps Mechanicus Outpost, which is on a tomb world, and the, the Necrons are starting to wake up. Well, okay, there, there is some stuff that makes it a bit non necrony the, 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 the hazard lines here, yeah. I, would, I would tend to potentially cover that up. But yeah. I would definitely look at it at something connected well, with the Necrons in some way. I would go the other way. If we could cover up these hazard lines, yeah. I would go steampunk. This is an abandoned resurrectionist laboratory Ooh. in Malifaux or a, ah, Skaven, like. uh, a Skaven lab. Yes. Ah, that would yeah. be good. Um, yeah. Even even within the worlds of infinity, oh, you yeah. could imagine uh, oh, them yeah. fighting over something like this. Yeah, or if you want to look at maybe something like Dark Age, maybe you find an old manufactory on the the dead world. Yeah, they're breaking into oh. it to try and find some working guns and stuff. Sorry, when you said Dark Age, I thought you meant like Saga Dark <laughs> Age. <laughs> no, the Vikings have found a chem zone. <laughs> No. Right, let's look at some of the details. Uh, first things first, so there's a, a metal plating surface, okay? Yeah. So you have all of your metal plating. Here we can see some metal plates that have kind of shifted and moved. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is they reveal this deeper substructure with all of the kind of the chemicals and things like that it's running kind of through. Great glow effect coming off the chemicals as well. It yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, if you look over here in particular, like just this one bit where it's peeking out from beneath, the metal plates, you can see that glow effect covering the metal. Yeah. For me, it's, it's the tiny details like this uh, toxic keep out sign that has just fell off a wall somewhere. Yeah. And then you've got the little bits of the plates that have started to like melt, and then you're getting that glow coming through. And then this could possibly be oil, maybe blood stains. Yeah. Over here, you start to see where they've done some uh, little tiny little bits of shading that show that a panel has lifted or another panel has started to collapse. And then you have your vents and things like that as and well. lots of wires. Here's particularly interesting as well because you have uh, the cabling um, coming out of this um, into uh, a whole swirl of kind of cables. I I really, really like this. And I think it suits the this particular kind of uh, terrain. I would maybe have a go at um, weathering this terrain to bring it down a notch or two in terms of its weathering. Yeah. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking Necromunda. Yeah, I'm yeah, definitely Necromunda. Thinking, if you were going to pick anything, Necromunda is the one to pick for this. Oh, because most definitely. that is the lower surface of a hive yeah, world I, right I there. I keep meaning to get more and more games of Necromunda on. I just do not get the time that I want. Yeah. Yeah. As I go verticality in different levels for skirmish games like Necromunda yeah. mm, to play yeah. across. Now, another interesting part of it is actually down over here, where we've actually got more of those cables coming up from underneath here. And mm -hmm. a big panel that has just been like maybe ripped up and off. Maybe someone's trying to get in at a bit of technology that's underneath there. Yeah, and the glow effect is is very yeah. very present there. Yeah, so. and you've got some of this like weird slimy goo coming out of the pipes, which is quite nice. Yep, <laughs> yep, we love that weird right, slimy dude. glue from the pipes. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, tell us about the terrain, Justin. So the terrain itself is foregrounds Jezerai industrial ward stuff. This yeah. is a, a really nice modular magnetized terrain yep. set. Yeah. So basically, I can pop the tops off here. You've got all your magnets on here, and it all just pops together. This also yeah. does come with lots of little extra bits that you can pop on, so like masts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Pop that on there. You can actually change out your heights and stuff. So if I pop this off, mm -hmm. and I pop this off, mm -hmm. this comes up here. Yep. Excellent. And just pops right on. Mm -hmm. right, if I take, we'll take that off. Away. Yeah. So that goes on. Then you can pop a top yep. on and because it's magnetized you can rotate you can it however you want rotate it however you want yep. and as justin says you can pop on your little antennas things. walkways whatever you please they've and then this got almost becomes like a lift yeah isn't and that yeah, kind of cool just down here and if you pop that there you know yep. that would act as a lift yep that's all really cool now the cool thing is and um, let me just show you this all comes oh. apart so boom 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 yep that one comes out as well um yep. like so 
So and now you actually do have the option. These can come completely out. Yeah. And there are other bits that come with the kit that I believe actually make circular grates on. Top I think of them. we I have one of these uh, sections. One set up as a grate. Here it is. Here we are. Yeah. So you've got mm -hmm. components like this that allow you to block those off if you don't want to have big pipes running through your stuff, which is a really nice touch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It, it is it is a beautiful beautiful piece of engineered um, terrain uh, once again from from the guys at Foreground. So um, if you fancy it, um, once again it's called the Jezerai Industrial Ward. Industrial Ward. So definitely well worth checking out. Yeah. Um, and if you're Necromunda, you'd be mad uh, not to check us out if you're if you're definitely. playing Necromunda these days. Right. I feel satisfied again, sated, ready for another week. Right, we're going to go back into the studio, get on with the show. Fame and fortune awaits in Blood and Plunder. Set sail in the golden age of piracy and claim the riches of the Caribbean at beastsofwar.com. Humanity has been driven from Earth, but now it's time to take it back. Join the Reconquest and fight the Scourge on the Drop Zone Commander Hub at beastsofwar.com. So this week, we're kicking off the news by a trip to the world of Harry Potter. I am so yes. excited about this. Me there is too. a lot of us creaming ourselves out there over this one. Harry Potter is coming to Kickstarter. Ben, fill us in. I think I can hear Dawn's yells of excitement from here. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this is a new project from Night Models. Uh, we'd seen some previews of what they were doing with the resin miniatures over maybe the last six months or so. Yeah. But now the final details sort of started to creep out about this game. It's going to be on Kickstarter on March 14th. It's going to be a miniatures-based adventure game. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all going to be on tiles and such, as you can see in some of the images here. You'll be playing as oh. Harry and his friends, going yeah. up against Voldemort and the Death Eaters and all the kinds of bad guys that you'd expect to see in the Harry Potter universe. And... Uh, um, it seems like it's going to be pretty pretty cool. There's going to be a whole bunch of different scenarios in play, so you'll be able to play through the events of some of the earlier books through to some of the later ones as well, which seems really cool. Uh, all the components are looking very nice as well from what we've seen in the teaser. And in the video themselves, you'll actually get to see uh, some of the other miniatures they've got planned as well, including um, the big troll, the troll in the dungeons, uh, <laughs> in the movies as well, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, this is looking awesome. Uh, this is all using the new... Um, as new sculpting that uh, Night Models have been doing, so it's going to have really finely detailed models going into this as well. So, yeah, uh, this one looks really cool. Hopefully, the Kickstarter is going to be pretty good as well. Hopefully, we'll see some uh, some looks at gameplay uh, sooner rather than later as well. That'd be yeah. very cool as well. So, yeah, I I'm interesting actually, stuff. Yeah, I'm actually really into, really excited about this for a couple of reasons. Yeah, one of which may not be uh, may, may not be immediately obvious. Um, obviously, I'm really looking forward to the miniatures. So, regardless mm -hmm. of the game or not. I think it'll be great to have some um, high quality resin pieces. Now, I haven't seen resin pieces from Night Mods before. I have seen some of their metals, mm -hmm. um, and the metals are good. But there are there are times when the metals leave a little bit to de be desired from Night Models uh, uh, on that front. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how they uh, how they come out of this with the with the resins. Uh, actually, I think. Um... Chris Handley, the guy that does all our stuff with us for Kingdom Death and Darker Days Radios, yeah, he yeah. actually picked up some of the newer resin models, I think, uh, after looking at some of the stuff he's been doing in the forums. And I think the quality of them is a lot better than what you'd expect from their, what they were used to doing with their metals. Mm, yeah. uh, so they've really stepped up their game with this stuff. So. Yeah, Chris's painting of those, uh, the DC models that they've got, yeah. Uh, it's very good, and it really shows off the models. Mm -hmm. I want yeah. that John Constantine model so <laughs> badly. <laughs> Bit well, of a question. Yeah. Is it just me, or is this coming in a tin box? Well, at the moment, it looks like it's coming in a tin box. Um, whether it does end up coming in a tin box or, no, uh, or not, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the other thing, the less obvious thing for me, mm. is I'm really glad this is coming to Kickstarter. Mm. Because um, one of the things, uh, one, of the, one of the effects of Kickstarter, especially these days, is no other platform is going to make you work harder for your game than mm -hmm. Kickstarter. Yeah. And this was the, this is the other thing is I have no doubt that the sculpts of this are going to be beautiful. Mm. However, um if it wasn't going through Kickstarter, I would uh, I would have some concerns that the game itself could be clumsy. Mm. Um or uh, or the implementation of the game into English could potentially be clumsy. Mm. Going via Kickstarter 
you're going to have hordes of people, many of which will have really high levels of experience in miniatures oh, gaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that their, their added presence, their added pressure um, within the project um, will, it will kind of act as, a, as a, an, an additional emphasis on the team at Night Models to really make sure that they end up with an elegant and fluid and easy to understand um, actual game at the end of this. There's one important thing that they're going to have to consider is that once people actually start sharing this out and around on social media, Harry Potter is one of those things everybody will search for yeah. at some point. So this is going to start to get picked up by completely non-gamers who have yeah. never even yeah. considered playing a tabletop game before in their life. Mm -hmm. So definitely, like you said, keeping it nice, clean and simple is going to be key to it. Yeah, but you're going to get those people jumping in. So I expect this one to go nuclear. Oh, the other thing about this is, uh, and this is a warning, um, a friendly warning <laughs> for the guys at Night Models. Um, you better be prepared for this Kickstarter, and you better be prepared for continuous communication and engagement with those who get on board with you on this Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Because I am not joking that this Kickstarter could be the best thing you've ever done. Or this Kickstarter could be the end of your company yep. if you don't get this right. Um, uh, that's that. That's how important this is. If you think that you're just going to uh, run this Kickstarter and then squirrel away for nine months while you work quietly on the game, that's not how this is going to go down. That is mm -hmm. not how this is going to work. So if you haven't thought about your ongoing communication strategy, you seriously, seriously need to take a moment and think about how you're going to continuously communicate mm -hmm. with those that jump on board on this, because this isn't, in my opinion, very likely to be a quiet Kickstarter. Oh, no, no, this, you on this, this, this is an IP which yeah. is known the world over, yeah. and I mean hugely known. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge gamble. If it goes wrong, it could yeah. blow up in their faces big mm -hmm. time. Just, just think about this. This was a small children's book. Mm -hmm. Written in a cafe in Edinburgh, yeah. and now it has theme park attractions. Yes, this yeah. is to me one of the actual novel series that got me into reading fantasy novels mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, like a lot of people are going to have that tie to it, and you know that sense of ownership and protectiveness to it. Yeah. So if it doesn't come off the way they expect it, mm -hmm. oh boy, you're in trouble. Yeah. From, from from what I remember, it does actually have a a well known rules writer behind the project. I can't remember his name right now but if i do find it i'll make sure to put it in the show notes but uh, okay. from what i remember it does actually have someone who's actually quite well known working on this so <clears throat> yeah that should be a bit of a fingers crossed moment i think so. yeah well there's one thing having a well-known rules writer but it's also the execution yeah. of it all how and the rules are structured how the how everything is translated translation on the car there's a lot of moving parts in this yes and you know uh, i just want to see it i just want to see night models have so much success with this mm -hmm. but equally we are, you know, what I'm saying is nothing new here. Anybody that's been following Kickstarter knows that the the looking at this, you know, this is a company that I don't believe has went to Kickstarter before. I can't think. No, of I can't. I can't nothing, nothing uh, comes to the top yeah. of my mind that makes me think, oh, that was a Night Models Kickstarter. So, mm -hmm. you know, they need to be prepared. You can't be prepared for everything, but you know. Holy moly, there is stuff at this stage of the whole Kickstarter phenomenon. There is stuff now that you that you, you should be aware of and that you should be prepared for. And communication is absolutely key here because yep. we have seen companies crumble as a result of, yep. of a poorly managed uh, Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to see that in this instance, especially with something as special as what Harry Potter could yep. turn out to be. Right. Rise of Queensdale Legacy Board Game Details announced. Ben, what's this one? Okay, so uh, this is a new legacy game that is coming out, but it's slightly different from the ones you may have seen in the past. This one is uh, uh, competitive rather Ooh. than it being cooperative. Mm -hmm. uh, this is by a pairing, uh, Inca and Marcus Brand, who are very famous in the board gaming world. And it's going to be out in German in March and then in English at Gen Con, as far as I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole idea behind this is that you'll be playing as different factions who are all trying to build this tower to honour the dying queen. And the legacy element comes in in that as you're playing through the game, you're starting to reveal tiles on this mat in front of you. Mm -hmm. It actually provides a little tiny plunger for you to take the tiles off the mat because they're a little hard to get off otherwise, which I oh, thought was pretty yeah. cool. But um, the other big thing as well is that between games, the person who won the last game 
will now have a different set of objectives and a higher points cap to reach than the other players. So say, for example, uh, the first player wins and it's to 10 points in the first game. In the second game, they'll have to get 16 points by various means. And also, there'll be other objectives thrown into the mix as well. So as you play between the different games, things are starting to change and uh, fluctuate. But there's also this sort of catch-up mechanic going on between the other players as well. So it's very much a Euro game sort of basis but then it's going to have this uh, legacy theme put on top of it so that every game you play will be slightly different there'll be lots of different objectives thrown into the mix and at the end of it you'll see this very changed and evolved board on the tabletop which I thought was really cool that so, looks really interesting yeah. uh, the idea of competitive legacy hmm. yeah that's kind of cool uh, yeah. yeah I like yeah, the well, idea that well, there's sort of a, a mechanic to actually mean that one person doesn't just win the first game and then just run away with it I yeah. like that increased difficulty idea yeah, I mean, as I was, I was saying to Sam a little bit because we were talking about this in the run-up to this, is that a Risk Legacy was effectively one of those games that came out that was competitive Legacy. Yes, but yeah. that sort of fell to the wayside when we had the likes of Pandemic Legacy yeah. and stuff in the past. When and those kind of games took over. But it's nice to see them going back to this and seeing a lot more different ways of um, using the legacy mechanic. And it seems to me like we're going to pretty much see it happen within the Euro game sphere uh, with very, very tight and easy, easy to play with and sort of um, sort of tinker with mechanics. But then adding that legacy theme on the top to make things a little bit different as well. So, yeah, yeah mm. should be cool. OK, next up, we have one that I'm actually quite excited about. So the guys over at Game Mat EU um, are releasing a new kind of um, a pre-painted desert-themed terrain. Oh, yes. Um, so yes. we have some pictures of that, if we bring that up. Uh -huh. um, uh, so I'm trying to remember what the name of the range is because I have been running around the studio going, this will be my Tatooine! This yes. will be my Tatooine! <laughs> and I have got everybody in the studio we referring to it as, oh, it's the Tatooine it's set! Tatooine <laughs> stuff, yeah. So this is the Desert Houses set, finally. They are from, yeah. I, mean, yeah, I haven't remembered the name. The name is now on screen. Yeah. Like so. <laughs> yeah, so the Desert Houses set. Now, I've been looking at this, and I've uh, it absolutely has been screaming Tatooine. Not in this... In this in this format, mm. but if you bring up the big the the first picture up big, uh, yeah, let me try. Okay, this. right. So Ben, what I want to do is I want to take this and put in all of the kind of Star Wars esque white cooling towers and uh, yeah. all of the gubbins and stuff that you would have found at the side of it. And what I'm planning on doing actually is Mantic released a uh, released the oh, terrain yes, crate yes. stuff recently, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they have a terrain crate which has pipes and generators and screens and stuff in yeah. it. I would say, Warren, this reminds me less of Tatooine, more of the, the Rogue One city where the Jedi Temple was. Ja oh! Jakku? Jakku. No, Jedi. that's not... That that's wasn't not, Rogue One. That that's was, not Jakku. Uh, Jakku no, is where... Jedi, where, I think. Jedi, Jedi. 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 that's Jedi. what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Apologies. No, I think, it, I, think it, I think it'll work uh, for think, Tatooine yeah. quite, quite well. No, hang on, it was Rogue One. Uh, yeah, Jeddah was Rogue One. Jeddah was yeah, Rogue One. Yeah, yeah, Jakku Jakku is, yeah, apologies, is yeah. a force Too many desert towns. Yes. Yeah. Uh, That's what this reminds me of. Now, you know what I think is going to happen? You're going to get in all the sci-fi stuff, we'll hand it all over to John, and it'll look amazing once he's finished making it, yes. until you start adding in all the CGI animals you couldn't actually put in there. <laughs> <laughs> for the special edition. Yes. Yeah. Well, the reason I think it'll work perfectly as Tatooine is... Um, if you think back to the uh, not the original trilogy, mm. but the 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 Phantom Menace, for example, oh, the um, those were the kind of houses where yeah. um, where Anakin, young Anakin, yeah, yeah, yeah. was brought up in that kind of hovel kind of a thing. Uh, the so, more village mm -hmm. sort of place instead of the the moisture farm. S say what you like about the prequels; they got the settings bang on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, actually, as an alternative to going down the sci-fi route, you could always use this in some kind of crusading context as well. Oh, God, so yes. set up yeah. the deserts of the Middle East and have your crusaders going through, fighting against the the Muslims and stuff. That could be pretty cool. So. Yeah, well, it, you know, it, you know that I have a, I have a passion project which I'm going yep. to I'm going to get back into very shortly of the crusaders mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely. So the, what I'm going to do, if you bring up the pictures, yeah. oh, I'm excited about this. I want to get some of this stuff in the studio. Okay. Yeah. And, this particular. Yeah. But what the way I want to do it is I want to do the sci-fi add-on bits um, in a, a magnetized in some way. Ah. Okay, so I'm going to try and see if there's ways that I can uh, drill little holes to put little magnets and stuff into it, mm. and put the magnets onto ah, the sci-fi yes. bits, mm. so as I can just plop the sci-fi bits on right. and have them stick to it. 
And if, then, if. when I'm not sci fi it, when we're not Star Wars in it, and believe me, having seen Legions, we are going to be Star wars the hell out <laughs> of this at the moment. Uh, when I'm not Star wars it, Ben is absolutely right. I wanted to remove the stuff. Hopefully the magnets are basically invisible. Well, if you recess them and then just put a little bit of paint over the top, you might be okay. Yeah, I think, I think, I think there is absolutely a way of dual purposing this because yeah, yeah. I can't be the only person in the world who loves Crusaders because I'm Monty Python <laughs> and who loves Star Wars. Because of Star because Wars. Because of Star Wars. <laughs> so, because of Spaceballs. This, yes. <laughs> so this this is a this is a multi-purpose terrain set. Do you know what else it'll do? What? It will do desert and um, World War II campaigns as well. Of oh, course. Cool. You've got some nice big creators here as well. They'll be perfect for the desert World War II campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice. And there, you know, we might have more to say on 28 millimeter desert world war ii campaigns yeah. uh, coming up very soon so it, it, backstagers keep your your eyes open for this Mesa? and this is a mess of kind of a terrain yeah um do we this is do we know this is the badlands terrain set yeah yep. and this is the sands of time battle mat so let me bring them up full so as the guys can see see it all yeah, look at yeah, that that works super well doesn't that work well yeah that would make a nice western setting oh, wouldn't Ooh. it just yeah but forget about westerns for the moment let's talk star wars <laughs> yeah if we put those, space western if we put those buildings on that right yeah. um and uh, put that badland set do you know that all of that is missing what pod racers oh, oh <laughs> yeah. tell me that was the best bit of the yeah that, that was yeah. That was, you know if you put pod racers on that, that you oh. would look at that and you go yeah absolutely yeah that is <laughs> that is the phantom menace We've right, got a there. Track right I, I, there. I, I, I tell you what, you could actually do that very easily. I actually have sort of a pod race demolition derby if you go to Osprey and gab, or grab their Gaslands rule set. Yeah. I got to play it last weekend. It was so much fun. Yeah. Um, but pod racing aside, yeah. when you when we put down that, that, the desert terrain on that, yeah. and we put on our little sci-fi bits, yeah. mm. and you start chucking uh, stormtroopers yeah. and rebels and ATSTs yeah. on that there, it will look flipping amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And Brilliant. I don't think it needs to be a complicated thing to build. No. Mm. I'm pretty sure that um, a, a one-week vlog series, and we will have them converted up in, yeah. in the entirety. Yeah. Um, Although, how weathered would you go for on the, the sci-fi bit? I'd go, pre I'd go pretty weathered. Yeah. But the underlying the underlying color of them will be white. Okay. Because that, it's that contrast that it just sticks in my mind mm. of of and Uncle Owen and Peru. I just I just yeah. seeing white cooling towers and mm. things like that. But, but once you get into the towns and everything, it's very grimy and yeah. But the, but the white will take the grime. Mm. If if it's very dark, it actually becomes more difficult to give that sense of grime. True mm. enough. Whereas if we if we do them white, now when I say white, I'm guessing here we will talk to John the expert on this. Well, what we'll probably do is prime uh, prime grey or prime like a, a cream, yeah. a skeleton bone, and then we will zenith it all with white so it all has that shading. And then we'll go in with streaky kind of um, grimy weathering uh, on it to bring it all up. If you look at the, the trailer for Solo, you yeah. can see the Millennium Falcon whenever she's brand new. Mm -hmm. Clean, sparkling white. Compare it to what it's like after a few years. Yeah. Exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm just so looking forward to that stuff. The the Star Wars stuff has just totally blown my mind. Watching it being played this week, even with your rules errors. Uh, uh, learning the even game. with your rules errors. Learning the game. We're right. both making the exact same errors, so the games were fair. The game yeah. was the games were fair, and to be fair, the rules are. Whenever I, they explained to me what had happened. With the, the the just the little th four dots on yeah. the corner of the card, yeah. and not reading the middle bit of the card, I thought, Do you know what? Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. And this is typical, um, and this happens anywhere that does coverage of this kind of mm. stuff. It's yeah. not just Beats of War. What will happen is we will record a lot of games in all in a very session. compact yeah. um, uh, space of time over the course of a couple of days. So what can happen is if there's a fundamental misunderstanding of a of a rule. Yeah. That on misunderstanding will work its way through all of the recordings. Yes, yes. Um, and there's just not a lot you can do about that. You're trying to give a flavour of the game. You're going to make rules errors anyway. It's just unfortunate whenever it, it, it's something that is one of those. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's so simple. Oh. It's staring you in the face every time you have the card in yeah, your hand. Yeah, but 
Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to now that now that they know it, we'll we'll get some more battles yeah. going because we have the Atat fight over. Yes, yes. yes. I am yes. so looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Anyway, the... what I'm looking forward to is actually now getting to trade sides because I've only played Rebels so far, so I yeah. want to see what life's like on the other side of the fence. Okay, <laughs> cut back to it because I'm about to say the Tatooine style terrain. It's not Tatooine style. What is the name of the terrain? It's called. Desert, the desert house. houses set. So the desert houses set is um, is it up for pre order? It's coming out on the twenty eighth of February. Yes. Um. So please don't buy it all. Leave some for me because I want to get some of that because I'm determined <laughs> to do a tattooing uh, board on that. I think I think it'll look amazing. Right. Okay. Um. We are now moving on to a feature. So we have the guys in from Monolith. Who are they talking to? It would be me and one of the guys from Monolith who are going to sit down and have a nice long chat about what's happening with Batman coming to your tabletop very soon. Which could end up being the biggest Kickstarter of 2018 at this rate. We will see. Hello everybody, I have been joined by Adnan from Monolith. Hi guys. And today we are talking Batman. Yes we are. So you guys have picked up the license to turn this into a tabletop game. Yes, we did. <laughs> so, That's great. Uh, Okay, basic info, what are you guys planning to do with this game? Uh, so, uh, we're going to do what we used to do with those, uh, those kind of games, with strong theme games. Uh, we're going to try and put as much theme in the game uh, the way we, we did it with, uh, with Conan and with the Mythic Battles. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one will also go through uh, Kickstarter, uh, like we uh, uh, did. Exclusive? Exclusive to Kickstarter. Okay. means that you won't be able to find it elsewhere. Mm. You won't find um, a retail version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? Because we've learned from our Conan experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also why Mythic Battles uh, won't be uh, retailed. Mm -hmm. um, actually, um, if we wanted everybody in the chain value to get their fair, uh, you know, share of the um, of the game, we would mm -hmm. have um, the game should have been sold somewhere around two hundred euros at the end. Conan. Yeah, Conan. Okay. Uh, so from that wasn't possible because mm. it's not the sort of um, price range that you see in retail and also the retailers themselves are quite you know uh, afraid to buy those games because it's it immobilizes a lot of their money mm -hmm. to sell games that have already been sold through kickstarter so it's kind of difficult for us mm. for them i mean so uh, for us we had to cut our prices at the beginning so that it would eat uh, the uh, retails at somewhere around 100 euros mm -hmm. and at the end we lost money with Conan in retail. Really? We lost actually money so that okay, is wow. something we've learned from mm -hmm. and uh, the games uh, the way we do them uh, mm -hmm. are just not fit for the, the retail um, um, business model. Well I mean like the the way I've seen you guys design your games is big box yep. every miniature you're ever gonna want to need for the game you know, it's a complete gaming system that you're yep. jumping in on when you jump in on your Kickstarter. Exactly. So uh, even, I mean, like if you did send it to retail, the things they have to consider is it's a lump of money that I have invested in. I have to wait for someone to then pay that money back to me by buying yep. it. Exactly. It's also taking up, you know, basically real estate within my store. And you guys don't do small box games. Let's exactly. You do big box games. Exactly. The, if uh, if uh, the retailer can uh, sell, uh, you know, uh, 10 games that would pick up the same place and mm -hmm. sell them uh, uh, in the blink of an eye, of course, that's what it's going to do. It's yep. only only normal. Yeah, um, it's, it's the way the marketplace works. Yeah, you're really. You're going to pick up what's going to sell. And we could go with smaller boxes. We could downgrade the content uh, of the game, but that really would hurt uh, the gameplay experience. I think that, yeah, I think actually putting less in the boxes would take away from the gaming experience from I your think, games. Yeah, I think, and it will hurt us the same way in the end because mm -hmm. people won't be satisfied with their, their purchase. They won't enjoy the game the same way that uh, other people on, on Kickstarter did so. Yeah, mm. that's why we were not going to go retail with the Batman Two. Okay, well that's that's you know that's absolutely fair, and it's it's a design choice that you guys have for yeah. your business model, for your game model. And that's something that we have stated very early uh, in uh, in the advertisement mm. of the game, so that people are aware of it. Mm. Uh, we're going all out on a, on a communication. We're going to have this Kickstarter that will last 30, uh, 30 days. Mm -hmm. And then after they'll have the pledge manager on which they'll be able to let pledge. So that's two windows uh -huh. that you will be able to, uh, when you will be able to grab the game. Mm -hmm. Now, the game itself, yeah. it is modeled on Conan, yeah? It is actually, uh, the base system is the same one, the THS, okay, designed by uh, Fred Henry. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been quite a few changes actually from uh, Conan to Batman. 
uh, on the hero side, the main one is that uh, the heroes don't die anymore. It was the case in Batman, where you had all your gems uh, in the wound zone, you were dead. Oh, in Conan. In Conan, I mean, yeah. <laughs> in Batman now, you can jump back into play and come back after, uh, after a while and yeah. recuperating some energy and come back and maybe perform the, the final action of the, of the scenario and win the scenario. Mm. So there is no more elimination in, uh, in, uh, in Batman. Mm -hmm. We have added some uh, new characteristic, which is the thought uh, action, because, of course, something that uh, Conan rarely does, think. <laughs> <laughs> but that Conan does a lot Sorry, more. really? <laughs> no, he, he makes all the thinking no, beforehand. No. <laughs> you know, then when he jumps into action, it's yeah, more yeah, like... Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so we have this new characteristic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, a lot of things that uh, have been added. Uh, you know, it's really um, a really difficult thing to balance a game mm. system. And I think the guys uh, in the development team did a really great uh, work on this. Uh, some very small changes, like for instance, adding uh, a level to the um, skills of the mm -hmm. hero. Meaning that, for instance, in Conan, when you had a character which, uh, who was elusive, he could move through the board without any uh, ah. problem. There was no level attached to it. Now in Batman, you will have a level attached to the skill, meaning that uh, just so like Catwoman does. I might Catwoman be able to does, sneak past one, maybe two people, maybe two, but if there's a third guy yeah, there, he's going to notice me? Exactly. So the guy uh, playing uh, the villain will still be able to block you at a certain point. Mm -hmm. It's not you know, uh, overpowered like, like mm -hmm. it was in Conan. And really, all those changes... Uh, like the, um, the level on the skill gives us more, you know, parameters to play with, mm. to create uh, different characters, mm. uh, to create different situations and create more, more well, enjoyable scenarios. Well, the, this is the thing, dropping into the Batman universe, yeah. it's, it's a huge, expansive universe, I'm going to say that right now. There is a lot to play with here, but it's such a thematic universe, having those parameters to play with is going to let you really enhance the flavor of the characters. Actually exactly. Actually fine-tune the characters so it, it feels like the character has jumped off the comic book page and onto the tabletop for people. Exactly. So I mean, like, I'm, I'm sure that's what you're going to aim at, and I hope you pull it off. We, as I said, now we have three people dedicated to do this full time in mm. our offices, uh, on top of Frédéric Henry working also on the, on, on the project. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is something that we're really going to um, enhance in uh, in Batman. We're going to offer 20 scenarios mm -hmm. in Batman in the core box, where there were only eight. In Conan, mm -hmm. we know that that was uh, some kind of a hiccup in the uh, in first uh, in the first Conan game, mm. um, and on top of it, you'll be able to choose which hero you want to play with. Mm. Uh, when you play uh, on the hero side, you'll be able to pick and choose which hero you want to play with. Uh, you will be also able to pick up the bad gadgets you want to start the game with. So really, it gives a lot more uh, replayability to the scenarios, and we have more than doubled the number of scenarios in the core box. Mm. So a lot, a lot of um, gameplay. Yeah, that mm -hmm. will be. Now, whenever box. you say you can pick your character, does that mean any character can play any scenario? That means that we will have uh, some characters that will be fixed, the hero, because they are in the plotline, in the storyline. Mm -hmm. So if it is uh, Batman going and defusing bomb, it will be Batman that will be fixed. Mm -hmm. And maybe his two other allies, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be able to pick them from a range of characters. I see. If he is uh, accompanied by someone like uh, Catwoman, who is uh, really good at defusing bombs, you'll be able to pick Catwoman. But maybe another character, which is, let's say, uh, for the role-playing uh, people in the same class, mm -hmm. you know, like Thief or, I don't know, mm -hmm. more like a muscle man, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll be able to pick your hero between a, um, well, a limited number of them, but you'll mm -hmm. be able to pick on three or four different heroes for replacing Catwoman, three or four hero different, uh, different heroes to replace Red Hood, etc. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, many composition and combination of heroes to play with. Well, That'll give you a nice amount of replayability for the scenarios. Sure, and really, if you pick up uh, um, a hero with the with the utility belt and you give him different gadgets, mm -hmm. it really gives you a different flavor to the game. Because if you go with the grappling hook, mm -hmm. you will be more uh, agile. You will mm -hmm. be able to move more uh, easily on the board. Mm -hmm. But if you choose a more offensive uh, weapon, I mean, more um, with a more damage capability, mm -hmm. uh, then you will, you know, be less mobile on the game board, but you will do more damage. So it's really two different. Uh, game styles that you'll be able to have only by switching mm. the gadgets. That's very, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, now, this is, of course, a licensed game. It is. So, is this the first time you guys have had to work with a big film studio, yeah? Like Warner Bros., yes. Yeah. First time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. This is, uh, um, yes, a larger scale um, from, mm. uh, from what we did before. They have um, a lot more, you know, um, things are more into processes, mm -hmm. making sure everything is validated at mm -hmm. each step uh, of this process. That is um, one of the reasons, and basically the main reason, 
why we went with 3D sculpting mm -hmm. uh, with this uh, this game. Every model in the game is, is sculpted in 3D. Yeah. Why is that? Because the first time we sculpt it, then we have to submit it to Warner Bros. and they have ah, to tell approval. us. Approval. Yeah, correct. And they have to tell us, okay, uh, this one is okay, mm -hmm. fine. That's the best best case scenario. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we have to change things uh, quite deeply in so the model I, itself. You know, Change the face a little bit, maybe yeah, change the maybe. position of an arm. Exactly. Well, the pose shouldn't be like this. Mm. Uh, the head should be smaller. Oh. Uh, the, I don't know. We had this uh, case with Enigma where the chin was too pointy for, the, for them. Really? Yeah, we had to, huh. to uh, you know, s change the, the, uh, the chin size. Mm. A lot of small changes like this that you cannot do with a traditional sculpt or let a lot mm. less, uh, you know, easily. Mm -hmm. With 3D Sculpt, you can jump back to the uh, to the file, make the adjustment, and send it back again. Well, I mean, like, uh, now you've given me some images that I have here. So, yeah. now working with Warner Brothers, you have access to some of the actual, the comic book art and stuff to actually give you direction for creating a, yeah. a 3D version. We so can I mean, get, like, we can, well, get the, our inspiration from well, yeah, basically so, all the comics. Yeah, so have. things like you've got Batman, you've got Scarecrow. For instance, the Scarecrow you just uh, oh, you just one? showed, this one is directly uh, represented into this miniature. Oh, yeah, from, uh, cool. Yes, that's exactly uh, the yeah. same. Yeah. Okay, has anyone seen this before? Oh, yes, this one has been, uh, okay. I think it has been shown yet, but I don't know if it has been shown painted. Ooh, yeah, say so hello. Here you go. So you have the, the Scarecrow with the mm. David Finch version. So I it's not the the, the 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 version with a pointy hat. But no, you know. it's it's a version where you've actually done big bellowing smoke clouds on the yep, miniature. Exactly. That is something you do not see very often. Whenever yeah, it was a, you would imagine a miniature working with gas, but you don't see it. It was quite challenging uh, to have all this and to have all this uh, something that will come up uh, nice mm. on the final final uh, miniature. And then material wise for the actual final miniatures, do you guys know what you're working with yet? Uh, we have. PVC for certain parts, mm. and we have ABS for other parts. Ah, this so. is really, if you like the way we worked and the way we did things with the uh, Mythic Battles, mm -hmm. you will enjoy it. And we took it uh, one step ahead again. Every time uh, we work with those uh, miniatures, mm. uh, you clearly have uh, a step forward between Conan and Mythic Battles, mm -hmm. and you will clearly have a step forward between Mythic Battles and Batman in terms of quality, in terms of sculpts. Mm -hmm. uh, we have worked the bases uh, to have them um, textured, mm -hmm. uh, things like this that really make the, the sculpts pop up. We see that this is, this is one of the things I've seen a lot within the industry recently is, well, last year was the year of the hybrid game, I say. So you have a, a board game, but it's got so many aspects of tabletop wargaming that you're going to be able to sort of tap into both markets to actually draw people in and say, you know, play the game, it's fun, have a look. Look, war gamers, we have beautiful miniatures. You want to sit and paint these? Fantastic. Yep. War gamers, oh look, we have a board game. It's a beautiful world, but there's also <laughs> these incredible game pieces exactly. that you can sit and play with. Yeah, that's uh, the, uh, that's right. We, every every time we do this, we really try to get it to the to the top level. And if it brings uh, other people to the hobby, that's just mm. great. Yeah. But it's it's that that crossing the lines between board gamers and war gamers, which I think is it's really nice to see. Because I mean, like a lot of times. Oh, I'm a I'm a board gamer. I'm da, 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 yeah, this is right. my thing. Oh, I'm a war gamer. Da, da, da. This we have is my people thing. of both. I'm both. Oh, yeah, we have people of both. Uh, what well, people playing board games a lot, people playing war games a lot in yeah. Monolith, and, and that a, really transpires. To connect between yeah. those two different subgroups, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. Okay. More artwork because this is the stuff that's inspiring you guys. Yes. I, I assume you don't have access to every last piece of concept no, no, we or don't. ever made, no, we but don't. I'm sure you have a fair amount to work from. So, Scarecrow, fantastic. Yeah. So Riddler. we have. The Riddler, actually, uh, the, oh, the mini is missing because it's being photographed right now, but oh. the, exactly the, the, the guy you have here uh -huh. uh, is the one from Hush. Uh -huh. You see he has a Hush, uh, a Hush miniature in his hands. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the one you will have in the, in the box. Nice. A nice one. And this one, yeah. Nice. Red Hood? The Red Hood gang. Ah, uh, no. This is the classic Red Hood. This is the classic Red Hood. This is from a narrative arc drawn by uh, Greg Capullo, and it's actually some kind of a retail of how the Joker came to be and yes. how we turned from this classic Red Hood uh, mm -hmm. with the, some kind of a capsule head uh, to the Joker yes. we know. Yeah. Yes, and I mean, like, I, I love this style. I hope to see a miniature like this in the game. It uh, will I, be. I, I, oh, he will be? Yeah, oh, it will okay. be. I will, the guy with the I wasn't going to press bank, you, but okay. Yeah, it, just will tell be, me this it will stuff. be. Okay. That's, ex that's actually something that was quite great with the, uh, working with the Warner Bros. and this license mm. is that we could pick uh, any character from any period of the comics, okay? But we wanted to have something that is coherent visually. Mm. So we didn't go uh, 
too uh, too much way back in the story of uh, of the comics. Okay? Yeah, so we're not looking at Adam West Batman. No, we're starting from uh, the Jim Lee's Hush, mm -hmm. somewhere around 2000, if I remember mm -hmm. well, up to today's Batman Rebirth, which is the latest uh, issues. And we've tried to pick up the pick the um, the characters that we enjoyed mm -hmm. in the comics, and that had a cool a cool look. Mm -hmm. Like this guy is actually iconic. This is the real first Red Hood. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on, of course, we have Joker himself. Yeah, the Joker. Looking fantastic. Yeah, we're we'll have his gun. Have, uh, we're going to have Catwoman, we're going to have Poison Ivy. We I'm, do. I'm really excited to see how they look on the tabletop. Yeah, we have Jim Catwoman Gordon. right here, oh, the painted yep, version. Yeah, Gimme? Yeah. <laughs> gimme, I'm getting a look at this before all you. <laughs> oh, that is All a these nice miniatures have been painted by uh, Martin Grobau, who is mm. a French artist working, uh, working with, with us. The Catwoman looks beautiful. I love the fact that you've you've caught that that feline pose as if she's just you know leaning on the top of yeah. a, a rooftop, ready to spring exactly. down and steal some diamonds because that's what we she all does. Know that's what she does. <laughs> lovely, lovely work. Here you have Jim Gordon. Yes, right there. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I love the fact that you even painted a little blood spatter onto the, the, the base here, you can see. Yeah, you, you have a, a, a lot of details on this miniature going on. You have the badge on the, on the belt, mm. uh, the tie, the, the magnum. Everything is very detailed and very, very, very nice. Mm. And he's playable in game? Of course, he oh, is. Yes. He's a hero, just like any other. Gotham PD on the tabletop coming yeah, soon. Yeah, you'll be able to uh, actually <laughs> to uh, control those guys when that's one of the models we will have, the GCPD. Oh, nice. Officer, so nice. Uh, again, the, all those characteristics that we have, the skills that we have on the uh, on the hero side, mm. uh, allow us to create really, you know, um, the, really to recreate the character in mm. the gameplay. And he will have a skill that allows him to control a lot of these guys, give them order, and you know, mm. control them on the on the game board. Yeah. Now, the one thing I, I probably should have shown very quickly is actually the Batman miniature. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, because we have a Batman miniature in the game. Yes. Why, why would we have a video about Batman and not show Batman? This, this, this would just be incredibly wrong. The internet would be horrified at I me. can only agree. Uh, so, very nicely designed. This is Big one here. of the Batmans we'll have. One of? One of. Oh, so you're doing multiple types? Of course, he has evolved so much uh, in the course of uh, the comics. This is again the Jim Lee version from Hush. Mm -hmm. uh, we we'll also have a Batman from uh, Miller. Mm -hmm. We will have a, a, and we will have some renders after death of uh, the Batman uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Zero Year from Greg ah, Capullo. Nice. We have those different versions of Batman, and they will each have their character sheets. Oh, I They'll see. each have their own so depending way on which of version playing. of Batman you're playing. Because, for change, instance, the nice. Batman Miller yeah. is still Batman, but yeah. he's older. Yeah. He's tougher too, but he's older, so he'll have maybe less mobility, but mm. he will be stronger. Mm. Uh, he will he'll have more resilience, etc. Nice. So this is something that we are able to put in the game, actually. It's nice that people can actually pick their favorite version of him then and actually lay him down on the tabletop. All right, let's, let's keep going through the, the images we have sure. here. So we've got Jim Gordon there looking like an absolute badass. We've then got, whoa, hello. Here he is. That's the Batman uh, Year 100. Year 100? Yeah, from Mr. Pope. Uh, this ah. is a narrative arc where you, we are kind of uh, in the future mm -hmm. and where Batman is still Batman, but mm -hmm. he's more, um, not so much superhero, but more like uh, a guy who, you know, dress up with his own boots. Uh, yeah. He kind of creates his costume himself. Uh, isn't I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little bit luchador feel off this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You see, he uses this uh, this mouthpiece yeah. to recreate, you know, the fangs. Uh, yeah. yeah, the fangs uh, really is um, a different approach uh, to the Batman. It's it's a very very nice uh, comic yeah. uh, issue actually. If you want to read it, that's yeah, uh, really cool uh, this because it's cool. more humane. You know, he, he takes hits, he bleeds. He's uh, kind of always, uh, you know, so, so two he's inches not the from ultimate dying. stealth ninja. No, no, no. <laughs> but he uses all this, you know, regular uh, gadgets mm. that kind of seem, uh, seem normal, I, I would say. Uh, but yeah, it's a very cool, very cool character, and we've put nice. it uh, in the game. Nice. Okay, so very cool looking. Next up we have... Oh. That's another version of Batman. That's Batman uh, Zero Year, uh, in a universe where uh, Enigma, the Riddler, mm -hmm. I mean, in the English version, uh, has taken control of Gotham City, mm -hmm. and uh, Bruce Wayne has lost uh, his memory, and he comes back to uh, Batman little by little during the... The comics and so as you can see he doesn't have all his gear he has to go with uh, his knife his crossbow his ma machete on the on the waist uh, so yeah, so, yeah 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 
So again, uh, another version of, uh, of Batman that will be in the game. I think so far, my favorite version. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> very cool one. Okay, next up. And Bruce Wayne, of course. Ah, because can, can we play Bruce Wayne on the tabletop? Bruce Wayne will be playable. Yeah, because we have some scenarios where you will start mm -hmm. as Bruce Wayne. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes he has to face the, the villains dressed mm -hmm. up uh, as Bruce Wayne. Because sometimes yep. the villains attack mm -hmm. Bruce Wayne for what he is. Uh, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You know, the... the yeah. Uh, let's say a good guy in Gotham City. Oh, he's, a, he's a millionaire. Oh look, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a villain. I need some money. This and, guy's rich. Yeah, right. And he also uh, openly helps Batman in mm. some of the story arcs where he creates those bad robots. Mm. So yeah, villains can come directly uh, nice. and try to, to hit him. Nice. Uh, whoa, what happened to Joker? Oh yeah, this is actually for those who uh, recognize him. That's the version uh, of the Joker taken from um, David Finch, The Dark Knight. Uh -huh. It's actually not the Joker. It's Clayface posing as the Joker. That's why okay. he's all, you know, Okay, I, I, I'm all. sorry. I thought he got into some, like, Venom or something. No, no, no. That's uh, the Clayface okay. Joker, really, where he attacks uh, Batman, you know. Clayface loves to do oh, this, impersonate other characters. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. basically what he does. Uh, yeah, and this one... When we, you know, read this comics, it was so cool. We, we thought, if we put that in a mm. miniature, it will look awesome. Yeah, yeah, so, it's it's translated absolutely beautifully. So we did. Uh, okay, moving along. <laughs> he so, had me there. As, yeah, as I told you, uh, Batman is cool because it's not only superheroes; it's yeah. al also regular heroes. Yeah. In the case of Harvey, Harvey Bullock, I um, don't know if we could even call him a hero. He's just a cop doing his job. Ish. Yeah. Ish, ish, <laughs> ish. <laughs> but is yeah, is uh, we thought it, w it would be fun to have him part of the uh, of the hero uh, roster, and you know, yeah, the, this the, the look. character just looks so worn out, so yeah, dark. That's the end of the day. It, it looks as if he's just walked into a <laughs> little apartment in exactly. downtown Gotham, closed the door behind him, <laughs> cigars hanging out his mouth, going, yeah. "I need a drink." <laughs> exactly. So that was that was fun to put uh, put him in. Fantastic, fantastic. Whoa, hello. Hi, this is another version of Killer Croc. We actually have uh, several versions of him. Uh -huh. We have this one, which is again taken uh, from uh, Jim Lee's Hush. Oh. So where he has the more, you know, mm -hmm. crocodile fails, face mm -hmm. with his uh, trench coat. Yes, 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 yes. See, Killer Croc was always one of my favorite characters in the old cartoon series and stuff, just because... Yeah. You know, he was just misunderstood. You, know? I mean, like, you could say that. He's not, he's not a monster. You could say he's that. Just big and green and scaly, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure he just wanted a hug once in a while for a guy. <laughs> I'll let you do that. <laughs> so here is another version of him where he has more uh, humanoid face. Yeah, but um, the body is a little more reptilian. Yeah. You know, a little more armor, a bit more mutant. This is Very another nice. version of uh, the Killer Croc, uh, the way it is uh, depicted in, mm -hmm. uh, in the comics. Yeah. Nice. Oh, hello. Is this, this the Manbat? This is Manbat. This is, nice. yeah, actually the uh, miniature that we have here, painted. Oh, has anyone seen this before? No, this is uh, the first time. Render or painted? Or? Yeah, both, both. Oh, guys. <laughs> this also will be uh, playable in the game, and you'll be able to bring him. On Hero or villain? Oh. It, You're not going to tell? That's a villain. <laughs> that's a villain. Yeah, he tends to, to switch sides sometimes, but he is more, he is more villain. The the posing on this alone is gorgeous, and the detail you've worked in to actually show him as the man bat is nice. All the veins and stuff down the wings. Yeah. If you love painting your miniatures, guys, this one's going to be an absolute joy to work very on. Very good looking. Yeah. You know, and then the uh, I like the way you've done the nice tearing of the jeans and stuff that is just expanded and burst out of his clothes. So cool. Well, this one's going to be in, a, in more uh, of a hard plastic, just to make sure that the feet stands on the ground, that it doesn't bend, that mm -hmm. the wings come out properly, etc. That is, it's nice to hear that there's, there's that quality control in there, that looking at it going, is this something that's maybe going to bend in packaging or in production and look a little bit eh. Yeah, again, we're building up our um, experience from, uh, from one game to another. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we're, again, with Batman, is going to be... Uh, Nice, very nice. One okay, step. one last look at the 3D render. He looks vicious. Yeah. Absolutely vicious. As you said, all the veins. Yeah. Okay, then we... Whoa! We have a Batmobile. We have a Batmobile in the game. This is also the first time we show those, uh, those renders. Mm. Uh, so, 
This is the um, Batmobile taken again from David Finch, uh, mm -hmm. The Dark Knight. Yes. Uh, it's one of the many versions of, uh, of the Batmobile. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of them, uh, you know, uh, yep. ranging from the one from Jim Lee, which is more uh, rounded shape, mm -hmm. to this one, which is more uh, boxy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this one will be uh, available as an add-on in, in the game. Nice. And it will be uh, playable. That's something that we really wanted to make sure of. Playable. You can play uh, with the Batmobile. Nice. Yeah. It will come with its uh, own scenarios for each map that we will have in the game. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to uh, use it, uh, make it enter in the, in the game board, mm. do some shooting with mm -hmm. missiles, uh, ram through walls, <laughs> etc. Nice. So really, the, always when we, when we put a miniature, it's not there only for, uh, for show. Mm. It's there really to serve a purpose, which is gameplay, and that's what we, uh, we did with the... I don't know. I, I would have kind of forgive you if this was just there to be pretty. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure I understand, but, you know, but really for us, it's bonus. gameplay first, and then on top of it, we try to build something nice, but it's gameplay first. We cannot put something that it's not purely uh, mm. gameplay in the game. Fair enough, fair enough. So that's why you won't have a bat, mm. uh, bat wing, yes. bat copter, things like this, because it just doesn't it match the scale. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, next up. This one is Oracle. Mm. Uh, this one is a hero also. She is actually the daughter of uh, Jim Gordon. Yes. Who has been shot by the Joker. Yes. And in this time period, she is on, uh, on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. After that, she'll be able to recover and mm -hmm. uh, go back into being uh, uh, flying on top of rooftops, a yes, superhero. Yes, yes, yes. But she's doing her uh, job uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this period as an oracle, you know, mm -hmm. giving data yeah, to uh, Batman. Yeah, mm -hmm. more like a, a supporting uh, role. But she will be also playable in the game. She will nice. have this ability to control a lot of people. Nice. Uh, of course, she won't be a master of uh, fist fighting. But, yeah, she no, will... No, I wouldn't expect that. <laughs> no, but, you, you know, it's yeah. always trying to match the, the miniature to the gameplay. And mm -hmm. here, uh, that's what we went for. Nice. Very nice. Absolutely beautiful design. And, again, this is probably having to sit and go through the, the whole approval process. So it's, yeah. it's nice to see that... There's actually that care from the, the parent company themselves that own the IP to actually make sure this is going to look absolutely proper. Yeah. So uh, very Honestly, impressed. we thought that it would be harder to work with the Warner Bros. Really? Because that's a big company, but it was uh, kind of uh, easy and, and nice to work with them because mm. they were really, they are really open and mm. they really, uh, you know, try to get what we do mm -hmm. uh, as, a, um, as a publishing company. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we had this really open communication with them to try and have the best miniature Basically, they validate everything in the, in, a, in, a, in the game. So, um, yeah, everything is purely uh, respectful yep. of, the, of the original material. Yeah. But that, that's, that's such a beautiful thing to be able to have, to be able to, to get in and actually play with that world. Because, I mean, like, I'm sure you're like me. You've grown up watching the TV series, reading the comics, yeah. and actually now being able to sit down and play about with it. I'm sure you go at home tonight with a big-ass grin on your face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, we had uh, some heated arguments in, uh, within the, uh, the company. Really? Yeah, to okay. know who we should <laughs> dish, put dish, dish. in the game, who we shouldn't, etc. So, yeah, it was, it was kind of fun, but it was uh, yeah, very, very nice to work on this, uh, on this license, yeah. Nice. Ooh, Robin. Yeah, this is uh, one of the Robins. Okay, because as one you know, many. yeah, he has uh, gone through a lot of uh, different. Uh, well, a lot of people have embodied the, the Robin. Mm -hmm. This one is the son of Batman. Mm -hmm. Is Damian Wayne? Yes. So it is the latest uh, Robin. Uh, let's call him uh, this way. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he's kind of a turbulent son of uh, of Batman. He's one of the Robins mm -hmm. uh, who kills people who don't hesitate. So yeah, that's uh, you. You can understand how it's a bummer for Batman to have a son who kills people. He's probably looking at going, "Why are you killing people?" Because yeah, that's exactly it. So yes, this is a, another version of, uh, of the Robin we'll mm. have uh, in the game. Yeah, I mean, like the the details that I'm seeing on the the 3D sculpts here, and actually what I've seen on the tabletop, the translation from 3D sculpt to miniature is actually really, really good from you guys as well. Yeah. So really. I mean, like a lot of people look at certain 3D renders, they look at them and go. Oh, that's not going to turn out like the, the actual final miniature. They've actually done a really good job here, guys. And the thing is that from the, the sculpting stage, we have uh, taken into account some technical uh, things that we have to take into account when we actually mm. cast the, the miniature itself. That's mm. why sometimes you have a slightly bigger head, slightly mm. bigger hands, yeah. uh, you know, some details that are really exaggerated mm. because we know that when we're going to go through all the, the tooling and the casting process, we're going to uh, lose some of the detail, and we know where we're going to lose it. Yeah, so so we can account it for early. it at the early stages, and that's why sometimes you can say, oh, okay, but you know that detail is too much, this is too much, but mm. really because Balance you have to think about the final result. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's, it's again, it's that process of learning and becoming better at your craft. Exactly. Ooh, hello, the so other scarecrow. The other version of the scarecrow that we will have uh, in the game, the original version. Let's mm. call him this way with the pointy hats. Yes. You know, and uh, his uh, famous weapon. Yes. Uh, so again, as you can see, this is a, a clear um, representation and example of what I just said. You see all the stitches mm -hmm. could seem exaggerated. Yes. Yeah, but if you don't do that on the 3D sculpts, uh, you will, if you mm -hmm. smooth that, it will be totally, um, you, you won't show. Yeah, on it the will final be lost. Minute. Yeah, it will be totally lost. Yeah. On the the even the, the stitching in around the mouth, yep. looking there, it, it looks a little heavy in the 3D render, but once exactly. you actually cast that, it'll look perfect. Exactly. Very, very cool. I am incredible. Incredibly impressed with these. So that's um, um, one of the versions uh, mm -hmm. we'll have for several main characters. We'll have mm -hmm. several versions yeah. of them. Uh, some didn't move, change, I mean, that much mm -hmm. in the course of the comics, like Two Face. He has yes. basically the same uh, representation, yes. you know, from uh, way back in, in time, but other have changed. So we've picked those who we thought are cool and we'll mm -hmm. put them in the game. Uh, I mean, like, the the miniatures are gorgeous. We know Thank the Conan you. system is great. You guys are back tweaking, you know, playing about with the actual system to make it run nicer and better. Yeah. And we have actually added uh, another added another mode, another gameplay mode, Ooh. to the what we call the adventure mode is what most people know, mm. taken from Conan, which is one versus many game. Yes. One uh, player is going to play the, the villain and the other are going to play uh, the heroes uh, together in cooperation. Mm -hmm. But we have also added the versus mode, uh -huh. where each player gets to play with this command board in front of him. Okay. So the villain will still play with this command board, but the hero will also have a command board in front of him. Ah. And we are will be in a one versus one a game where it's going to be more like a skirmish uh, game, really, where you will be able to draft your team from mm -hmm. scratch. You will have some restrictions saying that you have to take one uh, HQ, mm. uh, three goons, uh, three elites, etc. Yeah. But other than that, you'll be able to. Um, to mix and match your heroes and your villain, team up Batman with Robin, of course. Um, will you both be working off the, the same system for this bigger dashboard? Exactly. Ah. And you will have on top of it another layer, which is uh, actually hidden by this... Um, ah. this uh, well, 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 we'll have a closer look at that. In yeah, other days, I'll yeah? tell you more about it in the, in the, in the video for the, the first right, smartphone. Well. Thank you very much for joining you. us. It is very cool to hear about Batman. Hope you'll enjoy Seeing it. the sculpts, knowing what's actually going to be happening and what to expect from the Kickstarter. Yeah. Ah, now there's a question. There's a question. Let's the talk Kickstarter for a second before question. we go. Yeah. So, how many pledge levels are you guys planning to do? We'll have only one Just pledge one? level. Yeah. Okay. Pledge level, uh, what will be, well, we don't know exactly the, the name of it, but we can uh, give you the price of it. Okay. It oh, will oh, be okay. $139 okay. for the call box. So you'll have uh, two double-sided boards, so four environments. You'll have this uh, command boards, you'll have a bunch of uh, tiles, you'll have the cubes. Mm -hmm. You'll have those heroes board that we made uh, double thickness, mm -hmm. okay, so that they hold the, the, yeah, the cubes. Yeah, you're not putting your cubes all over the place. Yeah, just like uh, you, you could do with the gems in, uh, in Conan. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll have the dice, the, the five different type of dice that were, are not here but will be mm -hmm. in, uh, in the game. And of course, you'll have the miniatures, mm -hmm. uh, those cool miniatures in it. And of course, the stretch goals that of hopefully course. we will Unlock during the course mm. of the. Come on, you say hopefully. This is Batman yeah, on Kickstarter. But this is yeah. This I expect is, this to explode. This is always uncharted, you know, territory for us because Kickstarter is really moving fast, really mm. changing fast, and uh, the fact that we are exclusive mm. uh, can, you know, be touchy for some. Okay. I don't know. I I look at the exclusive stuff and I look at it and say, I have a one-stop shop on this. If I want it, now is my time to get it. You know, I'm not looking at it humming and hawing on a shelf six, seven, eight months later going, mm, do I want this add-on, do I want that add-on? It's that, it's that sort of high-intensity buy. Yeah. And whenever it comes through, I, did, I don't know about everybody else, but when a Kickstarter comes through for me, I feel warm and gooey inside. It's just like... Mm. Yeah, it's a kind of a little uh, Christmas present. Yeah. You know, all along the year. That's yeah. a kind of the, the feeling, yeah. And so, yeah, for $139, uh, you'll have, you know, a lot mm. of things in the box. Uh, actually, it's going to be two boxes. Two boxes. Yeah, because we went with something. Uh, we wanted to to make something quite nice uh, with uh, with this one. Uh, so instead of having uh, the core box plus the stretch goal, mm. you'll have a box for the heroes mm. and a box for the villains. Ah. So we we have divided the components into good guys and bad guys. That's and nice. even the cover of the box will represent heroes on one side facing bad guys on the other side. I didn't bring it to you today because I want people to 
look at the final version mm -hmm. of the box uh, when they have it. For I, a I moment. assume you're still working on it. Yeah, it's not colored yet. <laughs> we have the inks, the pencils, and the inks, but it's not colored yet. That's fair but, enough. Yeah, something that we went uh, we went for is trying to have this, you know, yeah, duality well, opposition. As soon as you're ready to show that off, give me a quiet shout eh? <laughs> We will, no problem. <laughs> so for the one hundred and thirty nine dollars, you will have this core box plus the stretch goals. Mm. Hopefully, um, many of them. Yeah. Uh, the twenty scenarios, mm -hmm. really, that's uh, something that we try to 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 bring with Batman is really. And make sure that we give a lot of content uh, mm -hmm. to the to the um, to the backers from the get go. Yeah. Okay. So you don't have to go to our website and download uh, any additional mm -hmm. uh, scenarios. There will be some, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but from the get go in the core box, you'll have uh, enough scenarios Plenty to play with. Life. Exactly. On top of that, we will have some add-ons, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, we'll have uh, three main expansions. Okay. Nice. The first one is the versus mode mm -hmm. that I mentioned. Okay, where you'll be able to purchase an additional command board and all the material you need to play yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the versus mode. We'll also have a uh, Wayne Manor expansion. Wayne Manor expansion. Wayne Manor expansion. Yeah, I'm curious, sir. Yeah, with a double sided board again. Uh -huh. Well, not really double sided, but you will see what I'm talking about during the Kickstarter. <laughs> you will have the Wayne Manor uh -huh. itself and the Bed Cave that will ah, be playable. Okay. okay. And a lot of specific characters linked to the. To the to the Batcave okay. scenarios. How many, how many times has Batman's Batcave been invaded? Many, <laughs> many times. <laughs> so yes, that would be some of the some of the scenarios yeah, yeah, yeah. you have there. Uh, so that would be the the Wayne Manor expansion. Yeah. And opposing that Wayne Manor expansion, you will have the Arkham Asylum expansion. So again, this sense of duality mm. between the two expansions, uh, where you will have uh, what we can call the Joker Land, mm. which is kind of a um, amusement park, you know, that mm -hmm. um, Joker uses a lot as his, yeah, yeah. As his uh, HQ. Uh, yeah, so that you will have this uh, opposition also between the, uh, the expansion. And finally, uh, the last add-on will be the Batmobile that nice. I mentioned. Yeah. Well, it, it all looks absolutely fantastic. Thank you for coming in and showing it off. Everybody, get your comments in below. Are you looking forward to the Batman game coming from Monolith? We'll move on here. We'll see you in the next one. So hi, I'm Richard. And I'm Tony. And we're from UK Games Expo. And you're watching The Weekender on BeastsofWar.com. This actually has me really excited. I'm so curious to actually see how this game is now going to play out whenever they went back to rework that rule system to tidy everything up. Yeah. Adnan has me just jumping at the bit to play some games. I'm really excited about this as well because, you know, um, if anybody's going to do Batman right, yeah. it's, it's going to be the guys at Monolith. This yeah. is going to be in same yeah and the other thing is that I, I, at home mm -hmm. i have discovered that andrea who has not been into superheroes whatsoever yeah. has had no interest in the avengers does she like the bat flash she, she loves the bat the bat flash she loves the bat. <laughs> well actually she she likes the, the what do you call the bat before that the Oh, uh, Christian Bale. Bale. That she loved oh, the Bale God, back. no. She oh, loves... he, was a, he was a great Bruce Wayne. Oh, yeah, he was a superb uh, uh, Bruce Wayne. Oh, he was better than George Clooney. I'll give you uh, that. Um, so <laughs> it, 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 it totally out of the blue because Manny is totally into Spider-Man. Uh, okay. my, my little Manny just runs around in Spider-Man gear all day long yeah. and then turns in, uh, then changes into Spider-Man jammies at night yeah. and then gets back <laughs> into his Spider-Man. He has Spider-Man pants, Spider-Man socks, Spider-Man everything. Spider-Man bubble wrap? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, he does yeah. have Spider Man bubble bath. And it, it, do you know what? At Christmas, I now have Spider Man pants, Spider Man <laughs> socks, because me and Manny's the same. It's just our little bond, okay? Oh, yeah. So now I'm totally into Spider Man. However, Manny started to get into Batman a little bit. Oh, excellent. And I was thinking, I love this. I have, of all the superheroes, the one that I have loved the most has been Batman. Hmm. And the reason being, it was the only superhero where I could potentially be it. If I won multiple lotteries all around the world. <laughs> and then spent your whole life training in all of the martial arts yep. and uh, studying, I don't know how many PhDs and masters Batman has. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's my favorite quote from the Justice League where Batman is asked, what's your superpower? Yeah. Uh, I'm really rich. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and it's, but it's, yeah. it is that, you know, yeah. ever since um, uh, Michael Keaton... Uh, turned Batman into the coolest of yeah. all the characters. Because remember, up until that, the series had turned Batman. It into... was spandex before that. Yeah, it not, was it was a bit of a joke. Gear. Suddenly, Keaton yeah. turned Batman into something uh, you know, a force not to be watched as a bit of light, kind of funny entertainment. Batman was an absolute force. Yeah, it then got a bit silly, and then Bale brought it back. Christian Bale's portrayal of Batman is one of my absolute favorites. I enjoy Affleck. 
Affleck is is pretty good, but but uh, uh, the Bale thing is yeah. great for me. Okay. Uh, the best one that got me were, of course, the Batman animated series, and I've mentioned oh, yeah. them before. Yeah. You well, should are... sit down with Manny and watch through those. There are actually two new animated ones coming very soon. There's Gotham by Gaslight, which I oh, that's this. out already. Oh, it's out. Yeah, Damn, that, was a, that. that was a that was a. And then drawn by Mike Mignola, who was the guy who also did the Hellboy comics. And then you have an Asian-designed one, which is a Batman anime, which is Batman set in the Far East, which yeah. looks as if it's going to be really cool. Yeah. I probably won't watch it, yeah. <laughs> because I, I love the live action. I love the live action stuff. But well, some, of we the, have, some of the best stuff is animated, though. We have had a quantum shift in the house. Yeah. You know, with Andrea now getting on on the board, the bat mm-hmm. Manny is now uh, uh, Manny couldn't believe that his mummy actually liked Batman. Uh, so now we're sitting <laughs> down to watch a lot of this, and, and it, it's just it is great. So this Kickstarter, mm-hmm. our household is going to be all over this and Harry Potter. How the hell are we going to feed the? Oh, who cares? <laughs> now now who you've, cares? Got, you've got to practice your Mark <laughs> Hamill Joker impression. I will. I will. Right. Um, Kickstarter time. So kicking off, we have the Heroes of the Fallen Frontiers. There's about 13 days left on this. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is um, a really interesting one. Lots Mm -hmm. of... We we have some busts and stuff to show as well. But first things first. Ben, talk us through the Kickstarter. Yeah, so uh, this is by the guys at Scale 75. Uh, This is based on a whole bunch of their different um, 35mm heroes from their sci-fi game, Fallen Frontiers. But this is them scaling things up. Uh, They they upgraded the models. I think they said they did about um, 80% more work on these to add more detail into each of the different sculpts. But as you can see, we've got some really fantastic looking character busts um, featuring some of their favourites from the sci-fi world. Uh, There are four of them that are going to be part of the Kickstarter and then going to be available at retail later. And then there are four that are going to be Kickstarter exclusive as well. So if you get on this campaign, you can get your hands on eight of the different busts to play around with as a hobbyist and a painter. Maybe pick the ones that you like from your favorite factions and stuff as well. Yeah. But yeah, this, this one's looking very, very cool. Uh, they've got some really interesting stuff lined up as well. They've got uh, new busts. They've got free 35 millimeter models as well. And there's an art book thrown into the mix as well. So you've got some some ways to get into the, the cool sort of um, background of the, the game as well. And give you some inspiration when it comes to painting your models, which is yeah. pretty cool. Okay, I have some of them here in the studio to show mm. you guys. Uh, so let me let me try and get in. Just check these out. So if you if you fancy um, some busts to paint, these are incredible. Just look at the casting quality of that. Absolutely beautiful. Look at the face, the facial details on that. Yeah, it's just amazing. Is he got a cigar in his mouth? He does. Yeah, he does indeed. He does. Nice touch. It is absolutely wonderful. The the sci-fi world that this is based on is is, is so well fleshed out. I know a lot of people are, are are just chomping at the bit that they would love to see not only this but uh, some actual um, uh, expansions to the Fallen Frontiers. It has quite a vocal fan base out there actually. Just look at that there. Wonderful. Now we'll bring in this guy. That's oh. the guy, I believe he's called Sphinx. Oh, I'm taking this one. I'm taking this <laughs> one. I was going to give away some of these as prizes, but I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm wondering now whether we will or not. <laughs> because <laughs> some of these are absolutely beautiful. I, I want that guy there for my desk. Mm. Isn't that just... Look at the face. I'm just impressed by the, the texture of the skin. Yeah. Right mm. The muscular um, the sculpting is just... Look at it. Absolutely wonderful. So I'm going to pop him off. Yeah, well, <laughs> put him to one side. Pop this guy on. I need one of these for showing off minis is what I need so I don't <laughs> drop them. Just check that out. What a wonderful... This, there's, the, they are absolutely flawless, mm. the, the casts on these. I Just cannot wait to off. see them painted. My favourite one is actually this guy, Drax. Oh, look oh. at him. Turn around to the back. Okay, let's let's go to behind. Oh! Yeah? He even has it on the emblazoned on his jacket. Yeah. I would have to... We'd have to get Ramad to teach us how to paint leather jackets. Yeah. And the arms are just crying out for tattoo work to be done on that. Yeah. And you've got one more there. Look at that. Actually, we have an unbuilt one here. Oh, they're yeah. beautiful. 
So this is um, showing the actual components, Justin. Yep. So this came in three parts. Mm -hmm. So very simple to put together. Nice big plug sockets to work with on the stuff. So this is going to be dead simple to put together. Yeah. Mm. That and the, the actual resin they've used is quite flexible. Yeah. So look, there's me being quite rough with that. Well, hold it on to there. Don't be too rough now. So. You're scaring me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it wiggles. It wiggles. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. Yeah, so um, <laughs> 13 days left. It's um, Heroes of the Fallen Frontiers. Just some amazing stuff there, guys. Mm. The quality is insane. Mm. And that's by the guys at Scale 75. And, you know, yeah. they, they do some incredible stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it's also worth checking out the paints from Scale 75 as well. There's some yeah. really... Um, it's just worth mentioning because I know there are a lot of fans um, of, of the paints from the guys at Scale 75 yeah. as well. Next up, we have The Reckoners by Navo Games. Yeah, I am so excited for this one. So what is yeah, that? so... Uh, so this is a cooperative game for one to six players by Navu Games, as you say, and it's all based in the world of Brandon Sanderson's uh, sort of superhero books, I think it is, and his kind of world. Sam will fill me in and make things all better in a second anyway. <laughs> but yeah, this is um, set in a world where all these epics, these superheroes, have turned evil, and you are playing as the Reckoners, who are extraordinary human beings that are sent to hunt down and kill epics. So... Pretty awesome job. Uh, pretty deadly as well, I'd imagine. Uh, but yeah, so this is a game where you have a whole bunch of different epics set out on the tabletop. You'll be rolling dice for each of them, and then you'll be using your character skills and rolling dice of your own and sort of mitigating things with a little bit of luck in order to try and beat each of them, learn about their weaknesses, and then eventually take down the main bad guy, which is called Steelheart. And as the game's going on, the city that you're protecting, which is called New Cargo, is getting attacked and the population is going down at the same time. So this is going to be a little bit of a thinker, a very heavily focused cooperative experience. Uh, so you've got a lot of thinking to do in this, a lot of sort of machinations to go around in. Uh, but the big thing is as well is that, of course, this is solo play as well. So if you're interested in playing a game that is also a little bit of a solo experience, you've got that to look forward to. Um, they've also thrown in a whole bunch of really cool miniatures as well. Uh, so you can get your hands on some really cool character miniatures. And of course, there's a big cool miniature for Steelheart himself. So yeah, and uh, now I will let Sam explain why this world is so cool. <laughs> yeah, I actually just finished reading this uh, this series a few weeks ago, and this was my first delve into uh, Brandon Sanderson. And the whole world, what happened was there was an event called Calamity where this red star appeared in the sky. And... Nibiru! <laughs> <laughs> no, this time. Okay. So you know what happened this Random people started exhibiting superpowers. But the problem is, every single one of these people called epics is evil. Oh. Uh, yes. Every single one. Oh, that's not good, is no. it? So is it the, the transformation turns them evil, or is it just the evil people? I don't out? want to say much, because I don't want to give away okay, what okay. goes on in the book. But that whole thing is explored. One of Sanderson's great skills mm. is delving into the background of ideas mm. he, he's well known for coming up with the solid magic systems uh setting out exactly what magic can and can't do in his mm. fantasy books and it's similar with superheroes here mm. but it's very interesting because every superhero every epic has their powers and they can have multiple powers and some of them are very strange or they can and they all have a weakness mm. as well um so right at the beginning of a book of the book there's one called fortuity who has the ability he has luck manipulation it's almost impossible to kill him because mm -hmm. he just he, he knows when the shot is coming he just just yeah, yeah, yeah lucky yeah, yeah. yeah exceedingly lucky uh but his weakness is attractive women right <laughs> <laughs> yeah and there there's countless other ones like there's one guy curveball very minor epic his ability is just to shoot shoot a gun without ever having to reload mm -hmm. ever and at the other end of the spectrum there is steelheart mm -hmm. the tyrant of new cargo who can summon energy beams fly around impenetrable skin super strong just he's what's known as a high epic mm. no the, the the key to this the uh, we have a world that is full of sci-fi worlds and yeah. fantasy worlds and things like that. It, whenever you said that every one of them is evil, that absolutely caught my attention. And because there's there's a there's a train of thought, Justin, mm. right? 
Oh, we're going for a, yeah. a front stage melter? Yeah, we're going for a little bit of a front stage mind melter. Here. Right. I don't think it'll melt your mind too much, though. But there is a train of thought within uh, within psychology and stuff like that, mm. that we that, that we are all inherently um, have evil uh, 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 and we will gravitate towards it. The, the, what's the famous saying? Power corrupts mm. and, and absolute, absolute power, power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, so uh, I actually find that notion that uh, every everybody who's an epic, there is no such thing as a good epic because once you have those levels of power, you will always gravitate to, towards using well, it for evil. There's so much. It, the books delve into this, and mm -hmm. there's so much I want to say right now, but I can't because I don't want to spoil it for people. <laughs> Okay. I, I probably will have to go and read this yeah, from it, the description you've given. It's is, got me curious. That is yeah. absolutely fascinating. My my favorite thing and the characters you play as in this game, you're playing as the reckoners, normal people who study the epics to find ah. out how to fight them. Yeah, and and that's and that's a big part of how the kicks how this game works is that what you'll be doing is you'll be rolling the dice for the, each of the individual epics, and then you'll be rolling your own dice and assigning those from your cooperative pool of of characters in order to try and. Uh, cancel their dice, take them out of the pool, stop them from doing certain effects, and also, as Sam was saying, finding out their weaknesses for each of them, so that you can eventually take them down and work your way up towards Steel Heart. So yeah. it's got some very interesting mechanics going on there in terms of dice and and luck and stuff. So the the mechanics sound great, and the actual components, I've got them them up on the screen here. Yeah, actually, are yes. really yeah. really cool because you've got nice molded plastic that, that you're then putting inserts into. Yeah, the top for your of. your trays. Yeah, yeah, which looks like a really really nice touch to this game. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because um, everybody has the, their thing that that, mm. that will that would take them to to do something evil. It, it almost takes us back to. I would love to do. I, I'm, but it's do you know? Even for me, I'd be highly reluctant to do this. Would be to 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 explore with you, Justin. What would it take to take you to your evil side? It's it's a very it's it's something. Do you know? We would never do it on camera, actually, because I I. It, yeah, it just wouldn't be something I'd ever want anybody to see. But trust me, yeah, yeah you, right. you we, have we can have that conversation. You, you, would, you would have you would have a, uh, a a limit at which point even you and like me and you are superheroes, man. You know, we're the ones riding around in ice cream trucks, <laughs> saving everybody from the zombie apocalypse. But there is a limit, and that we we may, even me and you would find it where we would become Negan. Well, quite frankly, the the greatest fear to turn anyone evil is for to be able to live a life without consequence, because then everything is meaningless. Therefore, you can do anything and never feel bad about it. I don't know. I don't know. I think I, I think if I were told that I could live a life without consequence, I, I still have something within me. Um, I don't think that would be enough. I, 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 I think that would the, be a trigger for I, a lot of people, though. It would be, but, but but I don't think for me. But I know that I would have. I would have a limit as well. Mm. I would have a limit, a fairly easily reached limit. You know, uh, uh, because there are there are people that I love immensely within my life, and I think I think you know I would go Liam Neeson on them pretty on people <laughs> well, pretty damn there's, quick. There's you know, there's your like, other major trigger though. The, yeah, the justification of a crime, saying that the ends are justified even though the means are horrifying. Yeah, yeah. So we're actually starting to discuss yeah, that. Okay, right. Let's anyway, it's it's a really interesting one. That okay. Right. Next up, we're, we're continuing on the on the subject of how how people can you know it can do extraordinary things. Um, we we have a a a, a, heavy, a heavy but really really interesting mm. um a discussion now with the with our historical editor Jim, mm -hmm. uh, where we're looking at the Tet Offensive, but we're also going to be looking. I'd, um, uh, some uh, some reasons you might want to get into historical gaming in general. Progress comes to a world of magic as science and the arcane combine to make marvels. Meet steampunk inventors and orc mystics at the Volsun Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. Become a general of mighty armies at the Kings of War Hub. Take command of elves, dwarves, and orcs in this game of massed fantasy combat on BeastsOfWar.com. Hi guys, welcome back. So we have Jim. Hey buddy, Jim has joined us. He's a historical editor. We uh, this is um, Monday marks the end of the five part Tet Offensive mm. um, uh, article series, which has been looking at gaming in Vietnam. A, a phenomenal series and uh, loads and loads of comments and yeah, stuff on yeah. that. So this was our chance to get a catch up with Jim, just to give you know, to get a quick um, overview 
of what has taken place and uh, some of what to expect mm. uh, come Monday. Jim, welcome back on the show, mate. Always good to have you. Um, Thanks very much. Always glad to be here. So the article series started on January 22nd. It's been every Monday uh, since then. Um, right. Loads of community engagement. People are just chewing and getting stuck in on this one. Uh, yeah, we've definitely uh, we've definitely had a great uh, community response on this one. Um, we started off, like you said, on the on the twenty second of January. We were aiming uh, at the last week of January, um, kind of on purpose in order to hit that January thirtieth and thirty first fiftieth anniversary. Yeah, fiftieth anniversaries are, are the ones you really want to hit. I mean, it's always great to do like the eight hundred and seventy ninth anniversary or something, but the fifties, the seventy fives, the one hundreds, you really only get one chance to do those. Yeah. Um, uh, now we want to do a quick shout out um, to uh, some of the guys, some of the people that helped with that. So um, uh, I believe uh, the big show, big props go to Dave Wheeler for this. Absolutely, Dave Wheeler was huge on this. Um, that's Dave PPG on the site. He uh, helped me a lot with a lot of, with some of the photos that he uh, that he sent in. Um, Vietnam is one of those conflicts. Uh, if you're going to do like you know some sort of gaming in in, in Vietnam, uh, no matter what scale. That you're really going to need a, a Vietnam-specific army. I mean, you don't usually get Hueys with your, you know, Eastern Front Germans or yeah. your Napoleonics or anything like that. So it's it's kind of tough uh, to do. Uh, sometimes it's tough to to break into that particular conflict because you have to go out and you have to like buy a bunch of armies or whatever to get to, to kind of get sorted on that. And guys like uh, uh, Dave Wheeler really helped out because they have large uh, Vietnam armies already already set up, especially his uh, his riverine force, mm -hmm. uh, his mobile riverine force. That's a brigade of the 9th Infantry Division that help out with a lot of the, a lot of the um, river battles that you see in the southern part of, uh, of South Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. That's actually one thing I've actually started to notice with historical gamers is once they actually start exploring different areas of history, there's always that, that one that just hooks their attention and the stories from that period are just exactly where they want to play and where they want to explore. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it, it's very, very collectible, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the historical gaming side of things as well. You know, it's, um, I, I've got to say, it is is absolutely one that when you get hooked, you totally get hooked. And um, I, I am now totally hooked. And I have the evidence for this, Jim. I have oh. the evidence. I have now been inducted into the historical Grognard Gaming Society. Well, I did. You, yes, are, you have. Check this out. Look at that. Oh, God. <laughs> there it is. Um, there so it I is. now have a seat at the table. I have my own um, uh, cognac and cigar, and I can sit and chew the fat, and, you know, because everything I say is historically accurate. Isn't that right, Jim? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you see, here, here's the thing. It reads on the bottom. On this 11th of February 2018, henceforth yep. and in perpetuity, a member in good standing. That yes. means you can do no wrong now. Uh, yeah. You can do no wrong. Uh huh. I can, I can now hold my own with all the other grognards <laughs> and, and just sit and chillax and, and, just, and just let all of this historical goodness just wash over me. Um, I, you, you, know, do realize, you do realize that, this, uh, that as a newer member, yeah. you're at like the silver level, then there's gold and platinum. Oh. So oh. Right, now, right now you've got the cognac and the cigar. If you, <laughs> if you, you know, when you get up to the platinum level, yeah. you've got the, uh, the uh, Southern Comfort and the pipe. Oh. <laughs> it's it's, this like, is great. it's like the Illuminati, there are levels. Yes, and this, is, this is great. It gives me, it gives me opportunities. Uh, to grow, it gives yes. me opportunities to grow. It, it's it, it is fascinating though. You know, it's um for many of you uh, in gaming, um you will, um you will come to a point um because we, we what what kind of spurred this particular conversation mm -hmm. on uh, about this was, um we had a community member recently talking about how you know they they, they had kind of mixed feelings and a lot of people do when they were in doing their gaming that sometimes they they can. I feel a bit childish or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. with this being your hobby. And I said, never feel childish. It doesn't matter what you play, you know, do it. Because we have a saying here, you'll be a long time dead. Mm -hmm. So you, so just, you know, enjoy, enjoy your life and enjoy your hobby as a, as a fundamental and, you know, an inspiring part of your life. However, if you want to, if you want to try and get into something a bit more meaty in the hobby, um, I have found the historical side of the hobby to just totally 
uh, just totally open up so much, uh, so many interesting avenues, mm. and you know, and it allows you to sit there and and talk to people because you'd be surprised how many people that aren't into gaming are totally into the, the into history oh, yeah. and 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 the history of conflict and stuff like that and it has been fascinating i've loved my journey through um the stuff in world war ii mm. this stuff with the uh, gym in, in vietnam my own personal preference just at this moment in time is that i'm really really loving the dark ages stuff with mm. the vikings saxons normans and uh, and the likes well, the, i find it an there's interesting a lot, there, there's a lot of real estate there in the camera yeah. yeah the thing that lets historical become something that's really easy to get into is the fact that there are so many documentaries out there how yes. many documentaries out there are there on like fantasy worlds and stuff yeah. pretty much none mm. if you're looking at historical you want vietnam you go to discovery channel you know national geographic for certain stuff yeah. you will find easy digestible content that will let you see into the world very easily that's a very good point actually because yeah. you know, you look at the historical side and you say well where do i start yeah. well you know maybe start by picking a cool movie yeah you know, or tv uh, series band of brothers yeah. is great for world war ii for could me. be a tv series could be a like vikings band of brothers vikings Honestly, is what has uh, led me into the to the dark ages stuff. Really interested yeah, yeah. in that. But if you pick a if you pick a cool TV series or a cool movie, you know something that you've watched. You know, m not from a perspective of oh, I well, I love history, but you've come away from it thinking that movie was really cool. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. You know, you could then take that movie as your first stepping stone. And as Justin says, you know, the the wealth of information that's out there in terms of documentaries and things. Yeah. And then. You just start slowly collecting and it's up to you just how much detail you go into but the beauty of it is is there is a lot of detail that you can optionally go into and it's that optional thing that i want to stress you don't have to be an expert from the start the joy of this historical gaming for me at least has been finding it out as i go along it's yeah, been brilliant for myself the one that i'm sort of skirting around at the minute is american war of independence american civil war i've been watching a lot of documentaries oh, there you go. Yeah. and they've, they've really just been making me want to play out those battles on the tabletop because i think it would just be so much fun and so cool to play well this is your man for oh, that yeah, 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 he's yeah. one of the world's leading experts in those periods yeah and especially on the gaming side yeah help so, me obj Kenobi. you're my only hope. Yeah, we, we've got to hook <laughs> these guys up we've got to hook these guys up it, it's um yeah uh, I, I, you know, it's well worth if you fancy joining joining me and in in my journey. You no, know, it took me a long time and a lot of effort to get into the Grognard Society, but yeah, yeah. It, I, I'm telling you, it's well worth it. <laughs> um, yeah, when you guys touched on a second ago, uh, are, are two really good points. Um, just me personally, I always call it the what I call the Braveheart effect. Yeah. And mm -hmm. back in the early 90s, believe it or not, I had never heard of William Wallace mm -hmm. or any of the wars of a Scottish secession or anything like that. And then, of course, I sat down in a movie theater and I watched the Mel Gibson movie. And I was, of course, blown away. And I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. I go out and I start reading about this guy and you know, reading about what's going on in the late 13th, or early 14th centuries, realized how absolutely crap that movie is as far yeah. as it's, it's, it's a cartoon. But it got me reading. So like yeah. you were saying before, you know, don't be afraid that you watch movies, watch television or whatever, as long as that's your first step, as long as you yeah. take that second step. Because mm -hmm. um, that's where you're actually gonna find out what really happened. But it's something that you never would have probably started uh, if it hadn't been for the movie. So the movie, yeah. you know, kind of gets you started, makes you aware of certain things that interest you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go, you know, offline and you start, you know, working on your research. And as far as finding a starting point and being afraid of never being an expert, I can't remember who said it, but there's a, there's a famous saying, uh, an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less and so yeah. finally he knows everything about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't worry about being an expert. I've been neck deep in World War II for 30 years and i still haven't found the walls yeah you know there, 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 there's no there, mm. there's no there's no bottom to it there's no top to it um you'll never run out of new things to learn uh, yeah. the thing about historical war gaming i mean people can talk about their different genres or whatever which one they like the best and you know that's a great discussion to have the one thing that historical will always win you never run out of fluff yeah uh, if you want to call it fluff yeah you never run out of background material yeah, it's it is it is fascinating. Yeah, and some of the stories stuff. from history are stranger than yeah. anything a fantasy or sci-fi writer will ever come up with. Well, on the topic of movies, okay, um, uh, Vietnam in particular has often been oversimplified in the movies, Jim. Mm. Oh yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, there are some good ones. Um, uh, the good ones, uh, I usually tend to, you know, warn people off like the really popular movies, but the, the popular ones like Platoon and Full Metal Jacket are actually pretty good as far as their, uh, their historical touch points, like, yeah. you, know, the, you know, connect the dots as far as, you know, what was going on. Um, you can mm-hmm. kind of see, oh, some movies are more uh, blatant or obvious about it than others. Um, others are more, oh, that's when this is, or that's what, that's what you know these guys are with or whatever. Yeah. And uh, down to like the, the shoulder flashes on the guy's uniform, like you know, Twenty Fifth Infantry in, in Platoon. That's the uh, the famous uh, Tropic uh, Lightning mm-hmm. uh, Division, Twenty Fifth Infantry that you see in, in the Flames of War Vietnam. Yeah, uh, where they were in November of '67, and it puts that little tight that little title card. Actually, it starts in September of '67. It goes through. Uh, Chris Taylor, that's Charlie Sheen's character, is writing a letter to his his grandma like halfway through the movie. He's like, "Happy New Year's, 1968." Yeah. Like, oh, well, they're getting ready to get near the Tet Offensive, and then right. at the end of the movie, there's this huge NVA attack, 144th NVA Regiment. Um, and then if you actually dig deep enough into some of the records, you're like, "Holy crap!" There's you know X Brigade of 25th Infantry Division near the Cambodian border, just like they say in the movie. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, 144th NVA is in the area and you know, there's other units around and it's actually pretty, pretty solid. Yeah. Full Metal Jacket's even more, uh, more accurate as far as, you know, the units and like what was going on and what town, what city, what day, what district. Um, so, yeah, there are definitely some good ones out there. Well, if I was going to put you on the spot, Jim, to give people a little primer of um, the background to the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam War, just in terms of, you know, just a couple of minutes of the setup of the war, you know, of, of, of what, you know, to, to kind of set the scene before we talk about specifically about some of the aspects of gaming of it. Um, can you, okay. how would you, how would you tackle that? Okay, so the Vietnam War is uh, technically, or some people call it the second uh, Indochina War. Um, it's going on, depending on who you ask, uh, for hundreds of years. Um, but you can trace uh, its immediate causes uh, to, uh, to World War II, yeah. uh, ironically to the fall of France. Mm-hmm. So Indochina, it's called French Indochina in those days. It's, a, um, it's not only Vietnam, it's Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. It's all one colony of France, French Indochina. Mm-hmm. Um, 1940 comes around, France gets overrun by the Germans. France has to cut a deal with the Germans as we get Vichy France and Free France from. And um, that persists through most of the rest of World War II. And what happens with a lot of French colonies is um, some French colonies go free French and line themselves up with the Americans. And some, it, it kind of depends on the generals and the, uh, the officers and the governors that France had in those colonies at the time. Some of them that I think that were a little bit closer to the Vichy government wound up as Axis colonies. Yeah. And you see a lot of Axis colonies actually having to be attacked and invaded by other French troops, Syria, mm-hmm. Madagascar, etc. Vietnam, or what's going to become Vietnam, French Indochina, starts off as a Vichy French colony. It's in uh, the Axis's pocket. Yeah. Uh, late in March of 41, I think it is, um, Hitler is putting together his tripartite uh, pact um, of, the, of the different... Uh, you know, his, 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 his allies, he's trying to get Japan to join him as an official ally. He's like, here's a sweetener for the deal. I'll give you this colony that's right next to uh, Singapore. Mm-hmm. That's uh, Great Britain's big colony in, in, in uh, the Pacific. With Vietnam, what's going to become Vietnam, you're going to be that much closer to invading Singapore and knocking the British out of the Pacific. Yeah. That's exactly what happens. So you have J- the Japanese invading um And I don't even have to invade it. You have uh, the Japanese occupying French Indochina. Mm -hmm. To resist this, a guy named Ho Chi Minh gets started. He's supported by the OSS, the um, Office of Strategic Services. This is the granddaddy of the CIA. Yeah. This is the Americans, ironically, kind of helping Ho Chi Minh get on his feet and getting started with the Viet Minh. Mm -hmm. So, ironically, the Viet Minh and Ho Chi Minh starts off as one of our allies. He's fighting against the Japanese. World War II ends, the Japanese leave. The French want uh, French Indochina back. Mm -hmm. The Americans are not keen on this. The Americans, you know, people start talking about that old school European colonialism and Americans, you know, the hair on the back of our neck starts to stand up. It's it's, it's not something that we're, given our history, it's not, uh, you know, something that we're a big fan of. 
President Truman kind of acquiesces and kind of supports the move. He kind of, you know, holds his nose and says, okay, you can have it back. Yeah. Because he's trying to get French support for the founding of the United Nations and NATO. Mm -hmm. NATO was just trying to get started. And France was kind of on the fence. It was a big communist movement in France at the time. So we were worried about the, the French uh, politically. So the French get back into uh, French Indochina immediately. Viet, uh, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh feel betrayed, and uh, there's an instant war. So that's the first Indochina war that gets started in, with French versus our former allies, the, uh, the the Viet Minh, in 1946. This burns to 1954 when the French lose the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, and of course everybody's heard of that battle. Mm -hmm. um, French make this last do or die effort to kind of take control of North Vietnam, where most of the communist activity is at the time. They get surrounded in this epic siege, just like 50,000 uh, Viet Minh troops there, uh, with 50,000 support troops, 100,000 total, uh, pinned down, uh, there's like 13 or 14,000 French paratroopers, um, allies, Laotians. Um, they're not They're not getting out of there. They asked the Americans for help. By now, Eisenhower is president. Eisenhower and the French never really got along very well. Yeah. Um, the French gets go so far as to you know start requesting nuclear weapons to, to break their, their people out of there. Oh my. The Americans aren't having any of it. The United Nations isn't having any of it. The French get kicked out of out of uh, North out of, out of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So the Viet Minh have won, and they say, "Look, we're taking the whole country. We're going communist." The peace talks come. They get badly disappointed. Sorry, we're only going to have a North Vietnam that's communist and a South Vietnam that's to be determined. We're going to have elections in a couple of years. We're going to set up this temporary government. That temporary government never really joins the North. Uh, the North loses patience. There's this guerrilla uh, war that kind of gets started in the South. At first, the North doesn't support it. Later on, they start. This is where you get those two sides of the communist effort in North Vietnam. You have the actual North Vietnamese government that's in Hanoi. Yeah. And in the South, you get uh, the National Liberation Front which a South Vietnamese journalist eventually dubs the Viet Cong, and yeah. the name sticks. Um, the French by now, are, of course, are long gone. The Americans slowly get dragged into it. You get the Tonkin Gulf incident in 64. Okay, now the Americans are in. JFK wanted to get out, depending on who you ask. Yeah. Wanted to get out of, of Vietnam. He, he kind of saw the writing on the wall. He gets, uh, you know, he gets assassinated in 63, 64. Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, is now in office. Tonkin Gulf is in 64. The Americans are getting you know, more and more dragged into it. We know now that Tonkin Gulf never really happened. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not it was an actual conspiracy or an accident or a miscommunication, that's, uh, that's up to your interpretation and whether or not you've been fitted for your tinfoil hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it definitely didn't happen, though. That, that's not for dispute. Those American destroyers, the USS Maddox, was never attacked by those North Vietnamese uh, torpedo boats. Yeah. Um, and uh, so now the Americans are in, in you, you start getting these big pitched battles. 65, you see I Drang, that's famously depicted in uh, We Were Soldiers. Mm -hmm. That's in November of 65. Operation Starlight, that's the big first big Marine battle in 65. Okay, now the Americans are in. Let's get it over with. Yeah. Lyndon uh, LBJ's uh, Vietnam policy, if you had to wrap it up in a nutshell, in the mid 60s is, oh, for God's sake, we, we so don't need to be there. Just, just get it over with. Yeah. It's big buildup in 66. The Americans really go on the offensive in 67. And uh, it wasn't really obvious at the time. And some people might disagree because, you know, they're looking at old uh, information or old records. But the, the, the records are in now. Enough stuff has been declassified. 67, the, the North Vietnamese were really starting to come uh, starting to come under pressure. The bombing was actually working. Yeah. Uh, they weren't sure how long their civilian population was going to put up with this. Their battlefield losses were astronomical. Um, they realized they weren't fighting the French. These are Americans. They have way mm -hmm. too much money, way too much firepower. And in mid-67, uh, some of the communist leaders in the South say, you know what, before we give up, or before we really go back to the, to the negotiating table, let's make one last push to really up our ante and then really give us a mixture of bargaining chips at the table. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is where you get the, uh, the uh, Tet Offensive from. Uh, so the, the, the Tet Offensive was a, was a push by you know, the, the Vietnamese then to try and 
um, uh, establish themselves a better foothold to go into potential negotiations then at that point or the the objective again it depends on who you ask yeah. uh, the, the, and one of the points we really wanted to make with this article series is that the enemy you know the communist vietnamese were not a united front yeah so it kind of comes out of uh general tan is the guy's name in the south in the uh, central office for south vietnam is like the communist infrastructure or political office in south vietnam the tet offensive originally is his idea and he's a lot more aggressive with it he's like we can attack everywhere at once we'll hit all 44 provincial capitals with we'll every american base will really hit the south vietnamese army and uh the south vietnamese cities and population centers and what we'll do is we'll cause a mass panic we'll cause enough confidence in this corrupt and uh just hated and there's a whole bunch of social, political, even religious reasons I can go into. The South Vietnamese government in Saigon is hated. And of course, the Americans are supporting them for reasons that surpass understanding to this day. Um, but we can cause this government to collapse. Yeah. There'll be a popular uprising on our side. Everyone will join us, the communists now, and we'll bring down that Saigon government. Uh, we'll put in a new government in its place, and of course, the second that new communist government is in place in South Vietnam, we'll demand two things, unification with the North and the Americans, get your tanks off our lawn. Yeah. Um, that was the plan. Uh, this plan gets to the North, the North takes one look at it, this is General Vo Nguyen Gap, uh, Giap, I should say. He's the guy who won the Battle of Yen Ben Phu, he's like, you guys are crazy. Mm -hmm. There's no way you're going head to head with the Americans and, and walking away whole. Um, but by now, Ho Chi Minh's heard of it. Uh, Lee Tuan, um, that's the uh, party chief or the, 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 the general secretary of the Communist Party in North Vietnam. He's actually the real power in North Vietnam. It's not really Ho Chi Minh at this point. Yeah. By now, Ho Chi Minh is really old. I can't remember how, how old he really was, but he was knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door at this point. Yeah. You know, he's, you know, everyone kind of bows when he walks in the room, but the, the real power is this other guy, um, Lee Tuan. He's for it. The original general in the South dies of a heart attack in mid-67. Now, Jap, who has never supported this plan, kind of inherits it. He's like, now your job is to make it work. He looks at it, he puts his own spin on it. And so you know, the reason for all this detail is that the, the Tet Offensive kind of has like this confused beginning as far as what it actually intends to do. And that's important because then, of course, the Tet Offensive happens, it gets this very mixed result. And the debate begins on whether or not the Tet Offensive was a success or not. Yeah. And how, how do you determine if something is a success? Well, what was it trying to do? And what did it do? And you compare those two. It's up for debate what it was even trying to do. Yeah. So as far as debate on whether or not it was a success or not, that's that's really up for uh, up for discussion. Now, the Tet Offensive um, is considered uh, by many, I, I imagine yourself as well, Jim, as, uh, as almost like a... Um, a great place to start in the gaming side of uh, Vietnam because um, the battles are a bit more conventional. Um, I've, oh, yeah. I've heard you refer to it almost as as un Vietnam in that it it, it breaks that co that preconception of the Americans heading out to find Viet Cong and you know the ambushes and booby traps and stuff. And also, it's it's spread over quite a lot of different um, uh, theaters of operation. So it's not just jungles; it, there's cities and stuff like that in it as well. Oh yeah, uh, Justin and I were talking about this before before we were recording. Is uh, you know there's that there's that um, stereotypical uh, preconception of what a Vietnam battle and uh, following what a Vietnam war game should look like. And you picture Hueys, you picture rice paddies, jungles, you know Rolling Stones music or whatever. You know here yeah. we go, uh, some sort of hidden movement system where you can't see the Viet Cong or the uh, the NVA. Um, and then the Americans run into something and, you know, chaos ensues. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the Tet Offensive junks all that. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the Tet Offensive is the uh, especially the, the NLF, the National Liberation Front, or the Viet Cong, but also the NVA or PAVN, depending on your preference, mm -hmm. coming out of hiding and attacking the South Vietnamese and the Americans in the open. Yeah. And that's where you get a lot of these additional um, gaming tables that you can set up that you were talking about a second ago. It's not just jungles and rice paddies. Mm -hmm. There are fire bases. Um, there are towns. There are cities. There's a lot of urban combat, believe it or not. Yeah. And we, yeah. we definitely hit this in the article series. There's a lot of big city battles in um, in, in the Tet Offensive. Now, you cover multiple... Uh, Sorry, Jim. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, at the, after that, 
there's the, there's the Tet Offensive that comes out and hits the Americans and the South Vietnamese. And within like the first couple of days, the Americans start that push back. And that's where you kind of, you know, if you that now that you've had your more conventional battle that you might, if you're a World War II player or a Great War player, or ACW player or whatever, now that you've had that, when the Americans and their allies start that push back into the jungles and, you know, that's when the, the battles become a little bit more of, on the, that standard Vietnam model. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you can go forward from there. Jim, what game systems? Now, you covered multiple game systems in the article series. So you're looking at um, gaming Vietnam in a number of different ways. And what, what were the key game systems that, that, that have been covered so far? Well, the ones that I use personally are um, Force on Force. That's by, uh, let, me get, let me get this straight because I always mess it up. Ambush Alley Games. Yeah. I'll explain why this is confusing in a second. <laughs> Ambush Alley Games that came out uh, that worked with Osprey um, a few years ago. I don't think that partnership is still uh, is still in, in production. Mm -hmm. uh, they came out with a game called uh, Force on Force. Yeah. And um, the reason that's kind of confusing is the very first supplement they came out with was for Vietnam called Ambush Valley. Yes. And there's also an Ambush Valley. Uh, book written about a U.S. Marine Corps infantry battalion so in uh, the I Corps sector in, in the northern part of South Vietnam. Uh -huh. So you've got a real book, you've got a supplement, you've got a game that are all kind of have either the exact same title or a very similar title. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the games I use. I also use uh, Valor and Victory for my for my larger battles. Mm -hmm. um, Valor and Victory was originally uh, produced by Barry Doyle. It's free. It's always been, uh, or it, it started off as free print and play. You can get it on Board Game Geek. Yeah. Um, and it was just a guy who really loved, uh, you know, back when there were, you know, much more in depth war games than really we see nowadays. There was just a guy who really loved uh, Van Squad Leader. Yeah. And you guys know who that, you know, the old Grognards. There you go. <laughs> you're the, that's how you get to that gold level. That yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I still have some journey to make here. <laughs> well, I mean, I, um, I, you guys know me. I'm like, you know, Jim Hex Encounter or Riskany Johnson or whatever. Yeah. And that game got too much for me. You sit down, you sit me down at a game of Advanced Squad Leader, and I'm like, oh my God, my brain is leaking out of my ears. This guy took that and he said, look, this game's out of print because it's got way too complicated. I'm just going to strip it down and we're going to play it the way it was supposed to be played. That's where Valor and Victory comes from. Mm -hmm. Open source, free to print and play, you know, written for World War II. It's World War II squad combat. Um, then myself and my my gaming partner here in uh, in, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Aras, that's uh, or Aras on the site, mm -hmm. uh, Alex, uh, kind of tore it apart, um, put Vietnam weapons into it, put it back together, saw where the math would take us, came out with our own counters, and we started doing some Vietnam uh, play testing with that. Yeah, and it worked beautifully. Now, I mean, I design and, and modify and tweak a lot of games. A lot of times they don't work. Uh, this this one was was a was a success. I'm happy to say. So those are the two games that I use in the series. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that that's not like you know most of the games that a lot of other people play. So we definitely wanted to cover other games that um, probably more people play, and that's uh, of course uh, Flames of War does a yeah. huge uh, Vietnam uh, supplement. Mm -hmm. uh, they start off with Tour of Duty, um, so that's where Dave PBG comes in. We also got uh, Bothy has a huge. Uh, Force Andre seventy seven. He was at the boot camp. He's yeah. got a huge. Uh, he's got a huge uh, North Vietnamese force, all the way up to MIGs and T fifty four, C fifty five. He's got a huge one. Uh, James one twenty three T. I'm hoping I remember that correctly. Has a huge force. They play also uh, Chain of Command. I think has a uh, uh, has a Vietnam uh, game system out there. Yeah. So there's a lot out there. Charlie don't surf by two fat lardies. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we don't. Because you know, when I'm sitting at my tables, I have to play the games that I have and I'm familiar with or whatever. But in the comments and also in our support thread that's now up, um, we're definitely trying to bring some light. And we encourage people who play these other game systems, Trade of Sur, Flames of War, the new NOM that's coming out for yeah. Flames of War. Yeah. Um, big coincidence there. Why did that come out in February of, 9th of 2018? Can we, you know, <laughs> it's because they, they didn't want to wait 875 years, Jim. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, yeah, so we're really encouraging these players that maybe have tables and miniatures and uh, setups and familiarity with the rules for these other systems to, you know, really start posting in this other, because uh, you can't post photos in the article uh, threads, but over in the support threads, you can post your own tables, your own you know, comments, your own documents, uh, YouTube links for your, 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 your favorite uh, Vietnam soundtrack, uh, you know. Um, every war has its ups and downs, but Vietnam probably has the best soundtrack. I don't think that's up for too much dispute. Yeah, but I think that's pretty indisputable. I, no, there, I, so. I think you, I wasn't expecting you to argue that one just for Waterloo. Oh well, uh, yeah. The, well, the bands from Planet Waterloo was cool, but it, it, but Vietnam trumps them all <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of its Fair soundtrack. Enough. So I, I have actually playlists for when I'm out, you know, jogging or whatever. That's like that old school, you know. Yeah, it's more of the American stuff, but that old school, like like, you know, marching, uh, you know, drum and fife music. But mm -hmm. so I definitely do appreciate it. But you can't put that up against Jim Morrison in the Doors. No, you can't really. Yeah, you, you really, fair you enough. really can't. All right. So Jim, if we were going to if we we're going to talk about a few of the highlights and the takeaways of the article series, um, so regardless of if you if you already game Vietnam, we'd love you in the comments talking about your experience in the different games that you game. Yeah. And um, if you have never game Vietnam you, um, and you've quite fancy it, get stuck in there and um, because there's just loads of takeaways from it and if you've never actually got into the historical gaming but you're thinking to myself to yourself ah, this vietnam stuff sounds interesting then again get stuck into the comments because um uh, there's a load of people in there that will, will do their very best to help and support you and get you on those initial steps and talk you through the the different game options but jim if we had to distill it down to a few highlights and takeaways of the article series that, that people should come and uh, check it out for what would they be mate Okay, um, so from the historical side, um, one of the things we really tried to bring home was that it's not a two-faction war. Yeah. We're not talking about the U.S. versus the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. um, the National Liberation Front, or the Viet Cong, was a very different uh, beast uh, from the North Vietnamese Army or People's Army of Vietnam, and they did not always see eye to eye. Again, depending on the size of your tinfoil hat. There are people, there are historians who will still maintain that the North Vietnamese army allowed Tet to happen. They allowed the NLF to kind of take the lead on it, knowing it was going to fail, knowing they were going to take tremendous casualties and infrastructure damage to the point where they were pretty much destroyed as a cohesive military and political force. This allows the NVA to take complete control of the war effort from the communist side. Communists were not always seeing eye to eye. There was a big, big problem uh, between the two. A lot of mistrust, a lot of cultural problems because the NLF, the Viet Cong, were almost all South Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. and this is kind of a big deal. Why we were in Vietnam supposedly to defend the South Vietnamese against the communists. Most of the South Vietnamese we were fighting were the communists. Yeah. And it just, it goes into the absurdity of what we were doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, we were literally fighting the wrong people. So from the historical standpoint, we also wanted to highlight some of the uh, allies that the United States had in there. It wasn't just the Americans, obviously. South Vietnamese Army was our biggest ally. We do try to make sure that they get mentioned. And we do use some of their units in some of our games. Um, terrible as they were, there were some good units in there as well. That's the Army of uh, Army of uh, Republic of Vietnam or Arvin. We also try to use, um, we do mention the South Koreans were in there, the Australians and the New Zealanders, the Anzacs, mm -hmm. had a tax force in there. I mean, we, 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 put, we put a whole game of them in there for, uh, for the Anzacs. Uh, and then there were, you know, Taiwan was in there, the Philippines were in there, all these, uh, you know, American allies in the Pacific. Yeah. This was really a UN sanctioned war like, uh, like, like Korea was. These are American allies in the Pacific that are very concerned about the spread of communism in the 60s mm -hmm. in the Asia Pacific region. More on the gaming side, uh, like what kind of uh, games you can play. One of the salient points we really wanted to drive home was uh, try a game. If you don't try Force on Force, try a game like Force on Force. Because what these games do is they, uh, they're specifically built not for World War II, like Flames of War is. And then, oh, here's a Vietnam supplement. It's World War II with helicopters yeah, and, and yeah. jungles, okay? That, ironically, might work for some of the, um, the Tet Offensive battles because of the scope and direction of the Tet Offensive mm -hmm. battles. But if you really want that, you know, under the helmet, you know, watch it, you know, who's on point, watch out for the booby traps kind of Vietnam uh, feel. Games like Force on Force, 
And again, I'm not familiar with Charlie Don't Surf, so that, that might also be a great game. I'm not yeah. you know, disputing that at all. Because it, it hands, it, it, these games really drive home the asymmetry of some of these battles and the difference between what they call kinetic and non-kinetic warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, it's true asymmetry, uh, as in like the f- first big part of the book, oh, here's force on force, great. Here's how you move your forces, here's how a unit shoots, take morale, take casualties. Okay, cool, I got through the book, and the wait a minute, there's this whole other section. Oh, here's how an irregular army works. Yeah. So when you're playing a regular versus an irregular army in force on force, the two players are literally playing two different sets of rules. Wow. The yeah. system's different. The firing systems, how they take casualties are different. What they're allowed to do is different, how their units can combine or shrink or fall apart or whatever. And uh, you're literally playing two different game systems. Um, and the winner, just like in real warfare, is, is the guy who gets his opponent to play his game. That's Sun Tzu. Um, that's right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... That's a big thing that I would, you know, highlight in, in games, uh, either force on force or, all, you know, also in the same wheelhouse as force on force. Yeah. Casualty management is a big deal in, uh, in, in, in Vietnam. Um, when a unit gets, gets, gets killed or gets eliminated, we, when you sustain a casualty in, in a game like force on force, or like we built into our, our Vietnam edition of Valor and Victory, you don't just reach out and take the figure off the table. Yeah. That guy is now knocked down. In force on force, you can if there's another friendly unit there with him, he can make a first aid check. That first aid check tells you, is he dead? Is he slightly wounded? Is he lightly wounded? Seriously wounded? Or did he just shake it off? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can get you can take a casualty, knock a figure over in force on force. You get a medic over to him. It doesn't even have to be a medic. You get a friendly soldier over to him, and it turns out he was only you know flash blinded, or you know he got the wind knocked out of him. Yeah, uh, you know, the bullet bounced off his helmet or whatever. He, he kind of shakes it off or he's dead, or something in between, and there's like four possible results. Those four possible results have different effects on gameplay, and then if he is knocked down, what are you gonna do about it? Um, You have to pull the guy off the board somehow. Uh, You have medics as actual units on the table. Not too many war games do this. You have a machine gun section, rifle platoon, rifle platoon, mortars, oh, here are my medics, you know? And, oh, by the way, those medics have a defense value, which means the NVA can shoot at them. So you have to protect your medics. Uh, we've had some great gaming moments with medics yeah. uh, in our in our games. Um, so this also means that because you've only got so many medics, that the Americans are going to really have to stay grouped up in these big, secure clumps. Yeah. There's no rule that enforces that. But before you know it, if the game is sufficiently uh, designed, before you know it, you find yourself doing the same thing that the Americans are doing in the real mm-hmm. theater. They don't want to go in the jungle. Every time they move into certain kind of hexes or certain kinds of areas, they have to make a booby trap check. Yeah. If a bunch of them move all at the same time, they have to make one booby trap check. If they move in 10 different directions, they have to make 10 booby trap checks. Yeah. So mm-hmm. before you know it, the game is kind of beating you into that Vietnam mindset of, Stay together, stay yeah. in the open, stay on the roads, you know, stay in the villages, and uh, we'll send the, we'll, we'll just bombard that area with artillery, you know, yeah. we'll just, we'll send a helicopter gunship strike over there. Mm-hmm. And uh, before you know it, you're, you're faced with the same, vicariously, obviously, yeah. the, the same kind of decisions that the Americans are faced with over there in, in, in country, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And you find yourself kind of doing the same things, making the same mistakes, falling into the same pitfalls. Oh look! I I, I killed a, an NVA guy over there and a VC guy over there, and before you know, it, you're, you're you're counting bodies. And yeah. oh, I, how do I still lose? Because the Americans did the body count in Vietnam, and guess what? You know, Vietnam's a, a communist country nowadays. So take a guess how that turned out. Yeah, yeah. Civilians and prisoners of war. We have had some terrible uh, or you know great moments um, on our tables with civilians mm-hmm. and and prisoners of war. Uh, I had a one of those gigantic 50 caliber uh, douche uh, DSHK uh, Russian machine guns in a hooch. I was playing the NVA, mm-hmm. and there just happened to be a civilian counter in there. And uh, we've got to run our civilians almost like the zombies in, in The Walking Dead, where either player really controls them. Yes. You roll to see if they move, and if they move, you kind of roll to see like which direction they go. Yeah. And these civilians just would not get out of that hooch. Mm-hmm. And I was I was happy, you know, I wasn't going to kick him out of there. I'm not even allowed to kick him out of there. Yeah. You know, but all that time, my, my opponent, Alex, 
He's got grain launchers, machine guns. He's got off-board 81 millimeter mortars sighted in on him. He can't fire on this hooch. And this DHSK is just chewing up his people. Yeah. And he can't object because there are civilians on the way. The second those civilians move, the look on his face yeah. he picked up that fistful of dice. And just went, <laughs> ah, and, <laughs> now you know, I can do it. Yeah. My my, my golden crew was a, was a grease spot within like 30 seconds. I mean, uh-huh. it's it's that you have this incredible amount of firepower. I hope you have the luxury of, you know, when and where you can release it. Yes. Um, booby traps, hidden movement, you know, there's just a lot of things that we try to address in the series uh, from a gaming perspective um, that I think are really interesting as far as, yeah. you know, Vietnam on the tabletop. Fantastic. Look, Jim, it is always a pleasure to have you uh, join us in the, in the studio. Um, the fifth part goes up on Monday. Um, we, uh, we will call it that. Jim, thank you very much. Um, right. Back to me and him and Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Take it easy, guys. A massive thanks to Jim once again for uh, for taking us. Right, competition time. We've got two prizes to announce, and then we're going to tell you how you can win the Star Wars Legion core set and the the beautiful battle foam inserts mm-hmm. uh, that they have uh, that they've created for that that just fit everything that's in that box and keeps it nice and safe but first up last week we were giving away the Kador colossal uh, yep. this bad boy here yeah uh, so let me just the, bring that the up for conquest you. and the victor okay and uh, the winner of that on bow was jp max congratulations mm-hmm. jp max go and fill in the claim a prize form on the website we're also giving away Rambo the board game, and the winner for that on YouTube was Thorsten Schleer. So, Thorsten, get in touch. Come over and fill in the claim a prize uh, form on beastofwar.com, and you can be in with a chance of winning that. Right, well, this no, week. You have won that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can be in with the chance that he might actually deliver that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up. Right, this week we are giving away the Legion core set and the battle foam inserts to keep everything safe. Yes. Uh, to win, on beastofwar.com, come across, create a free account, and put your entry into the comments under this video. Um, what we want you to do is to tell us what would be your Sith title. So in other words, Ooh. like Darth Maul, Darth Vader, Darth Baldy, Darth Baldy, <laughs> Darth Pratchett, <laughs> Darth Shorty, I'm up for it, and I will be Darth Dong. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to know your Sith title, your preferred Sith title, and what your lightsaber would look like. Ooh. Which, before The Force Awakens, I would have thought... Mm-hmm. They, they all look the same, but the Ooh. Force Awakens did something. I love the Kylo Ren character. I think of their so, yeah. yeah, that cross guard, but also the fact that it spits and it spurts and it looks like it's uh, it's lost control. You know, it, it, you do it, realize he's probably had to jury rig that thing to actually split the the plasma beam so yeah. that it comes out. The but side, it's, you know, w- when you looked at all the lightsabers in all of the six movies before that, when they were all so uh, so clean so calm so serene even vaders and then suddenly you have this character in kylo ren that is on the the very edge that is struggling to retain uh, uh, the the control and the very lightsaber itself it exhibits that it's a lightsaber on the edge it's a lightsaber that's yeah. uh, I, I tell that's you the lightsaber amazing. i would want what samuel l jackson's one because it's the only purple lightsaber in the entire series is it the only purple lightsaber yes. he specifically requested it yes incredible incredible <laughs> what about you sam can you think of anything on, on yeah. the lightsaber front i would have one with a like a cavalry saver mm-hmm. so basket hilt style yeah uh, because then you can so also a straight blade. So or would you actually have it with a, a fanned blade? I would have the curved blade of a cavalry saber. Oh, but could you actually you project do... that? Yeah, they'll, they'll yeah, Star Wars. They'll find a way. <laughs> yeah, in the uh, Jedi handbook and everything, there's loads of different uh, oh, right. lightsabers. There's a lightsaber whip. Yeah. Really? If they can make a lightsaber whip, they can oh, make yeah, me a lightsaber. Make it. Yeah, that is cool. <laughs> what about enough. you, Ben? Have you got a Have you got a lightsaber in mind? 
Yeah, so I, I always really liked uh, one that was owned by uh, Kit Fitzo, if anybody knows who he, this guy is. Oh, um, he's the one in um, in Attack of the Clones who um, force pushes um, the weird amalgamation of C-3PO and the battle droid apart, mm -hmm. that guy with all the crazy hair. But he had a really awesome lightsaber that had a little bit of the same kind of style to um, Kylo Ren's, and that the blade was almost like fizzing, and it was almost serrated as well. Yeah. It looked very, very cool. So, yeah. Well, if I were if I were running a lightsaber factory, yeah. okay, um, <laughs> I would create myself uh, one that's a bit like Darth Maul's. Actually, I like the the, the, the double blade. Yeah, the, the, it was like a, a, a lightsaber staff, but then it split. Yeah, and you could run too. And I would create as a gift for you yeah. some lightsaber nunchucks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's totally did the same thing. Actually, hang fire. I have actually seen someone take an old Bruce Lee movie where he's fighting with nunchucks and turn them into lightsabers. Oh, oh I've seen that too. Yeah. So cool. I want to see that. I will hunt it down for you. Anyway, let's get your creative hats on. We want to know your Sith titles and what your lightsabers would be like. Come across to beastofwar.com, create a free account. Get it in the comments, and we'll be picking a winner, and you're going to get yourself a Legion corset and the Battle Foam uh, to go with it yes. to, to keep it all nice and safe. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Why not support this, this channel? Support this operation. Help us keep the lights on. Help us keep our content flowing. Because if we didn't have any backstagers, everything would be gone within about... A week mm -hmm. everything would be over within about a week if you want to help us continue to keep everything running and keep growing and keep creating more content and more cool stuff that we can do as a community we rely on you coming across and joining backstage and um, the, the backstagers are our absolute heroes we couldn't do this without the people that have committed themselves to that very small amount of 379 you spend more than that on one coffee mm. and that uh, it, 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 and we that's what we would ask for in a month just to help us uh, continue on with your doing so if you sacrificed one coffee mm -hmm. per month to help us do what we do to entertain you that would be amazing. Yeah. And you'll have a little less caffeine in you and it helps you chillax and stuff like that. Yeah. Very good for <laughs> but for that, you do get access to the entire backstage catalog. So every mm -hmm. paint tutorial we have ever made, yeah. all of the project logs that we've been doing, you get mm -hmm. first bite at the tickets for events that we run through yeah. the years. Uh, basically, tomorrow is a big one for us because we will be announcing the winner of the Mythic Battles Pantheon oh, yes. Typhon Pledge. Oh, yeah, actually. So, yeah, that's yeah. It's so, definitely mm -hmm. a good idea to get in for that. If you're someone who has maybe jumped in for that seven day free trial, mm -hmm. drop your comments and you could be a winner, but you have to be a backstager at the time of the draw to win. Yeah. So and, and like he says, we have, we have loads of extra content every week. Yep. And we must have, we have, Hundreds and hundreds. We have we have well over a thousand uh, backstage videos in there. Yeah, and the vast that. the vast majority of them um are are cool painting tutorials and things like that. There, so it's well worth coming across and uh, becoming a backstager because it turns you into a hero. Mm -hmm. And there's not many heroes in the world these days, but we have our backstagers. Yeah, but and they it, it are won't turn you into an evil one like the the ones that he was talking. No, about. no, you'd be a good hero. <laughs> yeah, a good hero. Um, but if you want to be a bit evil with him, become a backstage drone. We'll allow that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you to Ben. Thank you to Justin. Thank you to Sam. Thank you finally to Az. We're going to miss you, Az. Bye, buddy. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And be sure to check out beastofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.